our leading indicators continue to signal recession. Indeed, they say that recession should be happening right about now. This is clearly an economy that's proving to be more resilient than a lot of people expected. I think people came into this year feeling as if the recession was inevitable, and that no longer is the case. We see the market getting down to 3,400, but then potentially flatlining through the second half of the year. We do think that equities can drop lower, but for us, it would take a lot to see those October lows again. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Well, that shook things up. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramford. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures up two tenths of one percent on the S&P. TK on a two year. We have five percent and a Fed share opening the door to a 50 basis point move this month. I think a huge part of our viewers are on top of this story. It was such a shock to see. And the real question is, did we see this coming? I did not. Higher for longer. I think we all saw that coming based on the Fed community. What I did not see coming is him opening the door so wide to increase in the pace yeah. again. We were thinking step down, step down, 25, 25, 25, 25, <sighs> then bang. Boom, bang. He's opened a 50. Everything we talk about through the next three hours, Lisa, is highly dependent I would say at the mercy of what we see Friday morning and what we see next week yeah. in CPI. This is a new level of data dependence. Not only did he come out and open up the door to a faster pace of rate hikes, but you asked the question last week, will he sort of revisit the disinflationary process and whether it has really uh, started? Not only did he basically suggest that it hadn't started, but he said that the data had been revised, that it completely upended their view. They've been completely right. surprised. And, oh, by the way, we got to go hard and we're not that restrictive. So your data dependence. Tennessee, Ibram Rabari writing at Citigroup, obviously looking at stronger dollar, thinking we've come a long way on stronger dollar. John will do that in the data, uh, folks. But he really talked about the new data dependency that's out there and that we've really never seen uh, this level of intensified data dependency. To me, John, what's important, I don't want to do the numbers down, bog it down. But the fact is, when you look at the numbers of these spreads, it's we've never seen this spread after spread. Well, let's get to those numbers right now. Equity futures shaping <clears> up as follows on the S&P, trying to bounce with positive two-tenths of 1%. We snapped a three-day winning streak and snapped it hard in yesterday's session. The S&P down by 1.6%. Here's your yield on a 10-year. It hasn't done a lot. 397.36. The action has taken place at the front end of the curve, a two-year through 5%. Two's tens, negative 106 basis points. The last time we saw that, Lisa, 1981, the early 80s. People are wondering, what is a historical analog to this moment? We get another round of Jay Powell. He is back on the Hill for day two of testimony, this time in front of the House Financial Services Committee. We also hear from Richmond Fed President <laughs> Thomas Barkin two hours earlier at 8 a.m. Will he revisit after yesterday or just simply double down and say, we're open to anything, we have no idea what's going on, but inflation is still a problem? Today, we also get a Bank of Canada rate decision at 10 a.m. This, to me, is really interesting because they've signaled a divergence from the U.S., possibly a, a, a pause in in their rate hiking cycle. Given what's going on with the U.S., what does that do to the loonie? What does that do to the currencies <clears throat> of banks Canada. that want to move back from some of the rate hiking uh, cycle that they're in if the U.S. is going as quickly as Fed Chair Jay Powell hinted at? And today, as far as the data dependence goes, does ADP matter? I would guess not, but maybe it will because we're in this new moment of, uh, of data <clears throat> dependency, 8.15 a.m. But the U.S. jolts job openings data. That's going to be really interesting at 10 a.m. Do we get an ongoing reacceleration in the number of job openings? Again, messy data, difficult to parse through the accuracy, lagging, and yet the market will trade entirely on each of these data points as they come out because nobody else has a better guide. And then it's on to payrolls. On Friday, there's one man responsible for the price action at the last 24 hours. Here's the chairman of the Federal Reserve. The latest economic data have come in stronger than expected. Nothing about the data suggests to me that we've tightened too much. Inflationary pressures are running higher than expected. We have more work to do. We're very far from our... Uh, uh, from our uh, price stability mandate, we'd be prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes. The ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be, to be higher than previously anticipated. The process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go <clears throat> and is likely to be bumpy. We will stay the course until the job is done. Chair Jay Powell, a different tone to that compared to what we heard from him in the news conference a month or so ago. Fantastic exchange with the Democratic Senator from Massachusetts as well. Senator Warren will play you that a little bit later on in the hour. Let's get straight to it with Francis Donald, the global chief economist and strategist at Manulife Investment Management. Francis, an easy one. What did you make of that? 
Um, that's not an easy one, John, because there's a lot of parcel through there. But the main takeaway for me is, yes, we could talk about terminal rate estimates and the pace of hikes. But what I'm hearing is just more data dependence. And myopic data dependence can always be dangerous, but is particularly problematic in an environment where we have weather distortions, seasonal <clears throat> adjustment distortions, low survey responses. We are in data that is really having trouble setting us a clear signal, at least over the long term. And I'm concerned that we're going to see markets that are overreacting to data points that have false yeah. precision and potentially even a central bank that's moving too quickly and making big policy changes even via communication off of data that I think is going to be very bumpy in the next three to six months. Francis, with the shock that we saw yesterday, does disinflation come to the rescue? Can we get a rapidity of sharply lower inflation? You know, I, I think the Fed may not be focused on specifically some of those uh, traditional inflation measures, but that rise we've seen in inflation expectations and market-based measures, that's what's keeping me up at night. That is moving in the wrong direction. Now, it's countered by inflation expectations among consumers that are still going lower. And I, I'm hoping that the Fed is focusing on those long-term inflation expectations, which are coming down quite a bit. Exactly. One of my bigger concerns is this summer, we're probably going to lose some of the disinflation momentum that's largely going to be base effects mm. so this downward momentum that we've seen is probably going to stall that's when we're going to start hearing those words like stagflation come back and if we haven't seen some slowdown in jobs by then a fed that's going to stay hawkish through oh. the summer after what was wrought yesterday is it walk it back wednesday i mean does he come out today to the house and change the tune a little bit the only way we're going to walk back this pricing for the March meeting is what we see in the jobs data in the next few days. And when I say jobs data, I mean we've got jobless claims, we've got job openings, we've got challengers, ADP, NFP. It's a like variable buffet of jobs data that's going to be coming through. And no one number is going to be, I think, more important than the sum of those stories, especially in an environment where we're really trying to dig deeper. we got to look at private sector jobs data right now, people looking at job postings on things like LinkedIn and Indeed. If you want to understand what the Fed is going to be doing a year, two years from now, which I think is even more important than the March meeting, you got to be looking at all of the data available and really making sure that you understand the comprehensive story behind it. Francis, I understand what a bind Fed Chair Jay Powell is in, how unique this moment is, and yet the flip-flopping of his messages is jarring. It's jarring for markets and it's jarring for people who are trying to get a sense of what the compass is for this Federal Reserve. Do you think that that in and of itself is detrimental or advantageous, given that that uncertainty actually creates some of the market conditions that are potentially tighter than they'd otherwise be? Well, it certainly makes our job harder, Lisa, because instead of saying, well, they've provided forward guidance and we can kind of rest on our laurels for six months, we have to be a lot more flexible when it comes to the data that's coming in. But there is a lot of short-termism in this industry and in financial media. When you're an economist, you're always looking for what is the next big story, and I don't want to miss that inflection point. But problematically, we have a lot of data that's moving you know, two steps forward, one steps back, and it's getting dangerous to extrapolate too far in the future. We have portfolios that are trading tactically, and they need to be moving off of that. But if you're a longer term investor, a lot of this is noise that's distracting from the signal. You need to be focusing 12 to 18 months, or even in some cases, we have to produce five year forecasts to tell us where our strategic portfolio should be positioned over the very long term. And so some of this focus on the Fed moving back and forth in a month to month basis, it's not valuable to investors. And sometimes it can actually be distracting, in some cases, even dangerous. Where do you think the market is getting the economy wrong right now? I'm not sure the market's getting the economy wrong. Again, it depends on your time frame. So Q1 is certainly much stronger than many people expected. That consumer is holding in strong. But the challenge comes back to, and I've heard a lot of your guests talk about this, where are we going to be down the road? And it is very difficult to discount the probability of a recession 12 to 18 months from now. So if we're talking about the next three months, sure, there's no problem in saying this economy is stronger than we expected in November and December. But if you want to argue for no recession, you have to discount almost every single leading indicator that has very reliably predicted a recession later in the year or 12 to 18 months. You can try to do that. We have a very different labor market. We have excess savings. Uh, but from my view, it's a very hard sell. One thing you can say is that the leads and lags in this economy may be different than what we've previously expected. But I would just really focus on your timelines. Are you talking about the economy in the next three months, solid, or are you talking about the 18-month outlook? I think a lot of strategists, including myself, need to work on really being clear about their timelines 
confidence for their forecast. Francis, and their degree of confidence around each timeline. Do you have more confidence about where we'll be in six months than maybe where we'll be next week after CPI? Oh, absolutely. And I think that's actually the game is what does the economy look like 12 to 18 months from now? Actually, I'm concerned about that. I think it's going to look a little more stagflationary than we'd be comfortable with. I'm less concerned about a technical recession. We know the playbook to trade recessions. We know what those look like historically. I'm more concerned about 18 months from now. We've been in a very slow growth environment for a pretty extended period of time, and we have inflation stuck around 3 to 4 percent. And problematically, the inflation that's rested in the system that's still there is likely to be less interest rate sensitive than the inflation that we've managed to kind of dissipate over this period of time. So this Word stagflation, there's lots of ways to define it. There's lots of ways people can talk about it. I think that's going to be more of a theme for us moving forward than we thought it was going to be even just a few months ago. Francis, wonderful, as always, to get your perspective. Great to see you. Francis Donald there of Manulife Investment Management. Credit to Mohammed Al Arian, who came out before the last Fed decision and said this Fed should go 50, said that if they went 25, they'd risk a flip-flop. And here we are. Mohammed published last night on Bloomberg Opinion. He said this is the new dilemma for Chairman Powell. Validate the market move and in the process negate in an embarrassing fashion the forward guidance provided just a month ago or stick with that guidance and fall further behind in the battle well, against inflation. And joining him is James Bullard of St. Louis, the PhD from Indiana. He's a free thinker. And John, between his regime research of, I'm going to say, seven, eight years ago in his latest effort to say, let's get it done quickly, Bullard is out front on the dialogue. I would agree. I think Mohamed El Arian highlights this really important point that is there a risk? Is there a policy error embedded in a lack of direction, in violently swinging approaches to monetary policy from one month to another and perceptions to the reality at hand, right? I mean, is there something that undermines confidence and sort of the mooring that markets have traditionally looked at? Or is this sort of an inevitability of this moment? To Mohammed's point, it was too early to embrace this disinflationary narrative. That's what he thought the risk ultimately was. And I made the point yesterday, what kind of narrative did you have to begin with if it got broken with one month's worth of data. What does that tell you about how strong your argument was in the first place? It's a tricky moment. He also oh, talked massively. about, yeah, I mean, there were visions also. So, I mean, but sure. again, this is like messy data. So to, to pinch everything hey, on could one change again point, on Friday it and probably and will. <laughs> yes. It's uncharted territory. It's uncharted territory, that's true. It's uncharted. Someone very smart said that yesterday. <laughs> Sarah Hunt's coming up in the next hour. Looking forward to that from Alpine Saxon we'll Woods about in about 48 time. minutes' time. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Bond traders have boosted bets that the Federal Reserve will speed up the pace of interest rate increases. Now, that's after Fed Chair Jerome Powell testified before a Senate committee. Powell told lawmakers he's ready for faster monetary tightening if economic data justifies it. Interest rate swaps indicate traders see a half-point hike is more likely this month. The euro area economy failed to expand at the end of 2022. Worse than expected performances in Germany and Ireland helped pull down initial growth readings. Gross domestic product was unchanged during the final three months of the year. Germany's economy, the continent's largest, shrank by four-tenths of one percent. In the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, riot police used tear gas and water cannons to disperse protesters unhappy over a so-called foreign agents bill. The measure would curb the influence of groups that rely on funding from the U.S. and Europe. Critics fear Georgia is sliding away from the EU and NATO and is increasingly pro-Russian. The German sports shoemaker Adidas has slashed its dividend and shaken up management. New CEO Bjorn Golden is personally replacing the heads of global brands. There's no word of what Adidas will do with the $1.3 billion of unsold Yeezy gear. The company halted sales after cutting ties with a rapper known as Ye. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. goal is to slow inflation. If you hit your projections, do you know how many people who are currently working, going about their lives, will lose their jobs? Inflation is extremely high and it's hurting the working people of this country badly. 
all of them, not just two million of them, but all of them are suffering under high inflation. And putting two million people out of work is just part of the cost, and they just have to bear it. Will working people be better off if, if we just walk away from our jobs and, and inflation remains well, five, six me... percent? Fantastic exchange between yes. Massachusetts yes. Senator Elizabeth Warren and the Fed Chair Jay Powell. And I have to say that's more than just theatre and drama. There's a lot of information involved in that exchange. And I would go back to the Jackson Hole speech in Wyoming from the Fed Chair. A failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. That was the original argument. I think there's a sense from certain senators. I don't want to sit here and speak for the Democratic senator from Massachusetts, but there is a sense from certain senators, and you can see it, that they feel like this Federal Reserve is being somewhat intellectually dishonest about where this is going. Are they really going to put unemployment up without causing a recession? Is that not the cost that they need to pay, the price we all need to pay mm -hmm. to get inflation back down towards target? And I think there's a sense from a lot of people that they're not being very open and honest about that. We don't talk before the show, but I'm thrilled you played that piece. I don't, I don't know if you did that or Lisa did that or somebody else did that, but that's America right there. This is really, really important. In defense of the senator from Massachusetts, I met her when no one, no one knew who she was, and she was just sitting there in a room, quiet and silent. And she is very different from the Washington cloth. There's a tension here, right? And you can feel it underpinning some of the discussions with the Fed saying, we have a blunt tool. This is our tool. We have to bring down inflation. And you guys have other tools, talking about the debt ceiling, talking about other things. And uh, Senator Warren saying, well, why are you using this tool so aggressively? Do you really think that it's warranted? And right now, we don't even know how high the no. unemployment rate. This is all theoretical because the unemployment rate hasn't gone up, which is actually, ironically, a liability for a lot of Whether fair or not, Jerome Powell, part of the fancy class, Elizabeth Elizabeth Warren was not. She's out of Houston and Rutgers. She clawed her way up to the absolute elite pillar of bankruptcy law, more than qualified to talk about the dynamics of the American economy. Anne-Marie Horton is as well, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. That was really some moment, Anne-Marie Horton, and really sums up Main Street and Wall Street. Who won the day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is some moment. I actually, Tom, I was the one that asked for that exchange to be requested because you see Powell immediately jump on Senator Warren and say, well, this is, as Lisa says, the only tool I have. Would it be better off that we have higher inflation? Remember, last time Powell was in front of lawmakers, inflation was nearing 9%. So now he's in front of them, and he was able to get inflation down a bit. The big concern on Capitol Hill, which you constantly heard yesterday, was what does this mean for the labor market? Also, what do higher rates mean for people who are trying to pay their mortgages or they're trying to buy homes? This is something that was right. continuously brought up to Jerome Powell yesterday, um, and, and it was a difficult one. But as Mike McKee said yesterday, this is a 70 – This his remarks have a 72-hour shelf life because we really need to see what comes out Friday morning. But the culture of Washington, you've got somebody, Warren herself says she grew up on the ragged edge of the middle class. Jerome Powell had every advantage with qualified parents and, and such, Georgetown Prep, Princeton, and on and on. Who won the day there? Who's winning the day in Washington, Main Street or fancy Wall Street? I think it depends who you ask. I think yesterday, though, Main Street won. The questions constantly on Jerome Powell were about the struggles of everyday Americans, whether or not it was a Republican or a Democrat asking a lot of these questions. I mean, there was a host of other issues that were put forward to Jay Powell that obviously both sides were trying to play politics, whether it was about capital requirements of banks. Clearly, the bank lobbyists have been working overtime the past few weeks because that was brought up uh, a number of times from Republicans, or whether or not the, the, the Fed should be involved when it comes to climate change, what they think about the debt ceiling, as well as who should be his number two, because there's a growing course that thinks it really needs to be, for the first time ever, a Latino pick. But when it comes to how how this Fed is acting, many Democrats and Republicans are concerned. Mo a lot of Democrats that are up for re-election in 2024, including the chair of that committee, Sherrod Brown, because in 2024, the worry and the risk is that there will be a high unemployment rate and a potentially a recession. And Marie, I'm looking right now at a 10-year yield that's still hovering around 4 percent. Granted, it did not go up significantly yesterday in tandem with the two-year yield, which is why we're seeing that inversion. But it raises questions for longer-term borrowing costs for the United States. How much was that sort of underpinning some of the discussion, the concern that you could start to see deficits really pick up disproportionately in response to what we're seeing in the bond market? 
I mean, this these concerns a lot of lawmakers brought up when it comes to higher interest rates. They are concerned, although you did have one uh, senator say that he thought he had a hell of a deal at 10 percent interest rates when he bought his first house in the late 1990s, and since then, rates have actually been quite low. But these are, these are concerns across the political spectrum, and this is their moment where politicians ha have their chance to ask the Fed chair how he sees this playing out. Um, but a lot of questions remain. And when it comes to the deficit, we're going to hear from the president tomorrow on his plan and how he thinks he could bring down the deficit and at the same time make sure that these entitlement programs like Medicare and Social Security remain uh, solvent. But of course, we know that all of these things the president's going to talk about tomorrow really don't have um, any legs in getting through Congress. Well, and this is a reason why yesterday when he proposed this tax on income above $400,000, a lot of people didn't even talk about it because it was just assumed to be dead in the water. Is it? I mean, is it basically dead in the water or is there increasing support for this type of uh, proposal? No, no, no. This, this is dead in the water. Remember the last Congress, the Democrats had control of the House and the Senate. And they were, they're still Trump era tax cuts that have lived through a Democratic Senate, House, and White House. And they still were unable to even close the carried interest loophole that benefits Wall Street. So if you think that this Congress, that now the Republicans have control of the House, is going to be able to get through any tax hikes, it, they're dreaming. It's not going to happen. I'll take 90s house prices at a 10% mortgage any day of the week. Wouldn't you? That's a take good. a 90s house price? <laughs> but that's that's the key point, right? I mean, how much I mean, has on. the entire housing market changed and gotten valued much higher? Radically. As a result of the mortgage rates where they were. In a massive way. I mean, cry me a river, anyone who bought a house, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, stop. <laughs> Anne-Marie, thank you. <laughs> Down in Washington, D.C. Really nice. Thank you very much. Just wonderful. Are we going to see more of that? Chairman Powell, day two, in front of the House Financial I, Services it, Committee a little bit later. Do, do somebody, do those handlers or whatever, and I mean that in a constructive way, do they say, let's walk back the tone a little bit? I, I don't have a strong opinion. My opinion is the market spoke, and, you know, we haven't talked enough about it yet across all these spreads. These are historic When it's in your opening testimony, Tom, it's pretty deliberate. And clearly yeah. it, it had a lot of thought put into it. I'll go with that. It's, is it highly dependent on Friday and next week? Absolutely. And I think maybe he knows that too, that this market's going to price it back out if we get a disappointed payrolls and a CPI that comes in beneath, below expectations. Nothing that happened in this market would derail his message. I mean, some people could say, well, what if something broke? Well, nothing broke. In fact, you saw a 1.5% decline in the S&P. You could argue it's surprising it wasn't even more. We're talking suddenly the real realization that 6% interest rates might not be out of the picture. Rick Reeder of uh, BlackRock saying that he doesn't think that that's without uh, over the realm of possibility. The fact that we did not see more of a decline and that we're trying to eke out gains today I tells you a lot about where we are. Yeah, I was surprised... Now not so much the doubt on 500 points, but that the VIX really didn't move all that much. I thought we'd see a greater move in equities given 100 beeps and two's tens. I will say this, though, on the 50. There's two interesting points here, not just that he opened the door. For a lot of people on the south side, he appeared to lower the bar for it as well. I think there was a sense already on Wall Street that 50 might be an option if you get another blowout figure on payrolls on Friday. Now the takeaway seems to be you get around 200, 300K. This door is still wide open. CPI comes in at 0.4%. In fact, Matt Lazzetti and I went back and forth yesterday evening over at Deutsche Bank, and Matt said 300,000 on payrolls is what they're looking for. 0.4% on core CPI next week. If we get that, this market's going to go with 50. And if the market goes with 50, the Fed's likely to follow through. Andrew Hollenhorst, the city, raised an interesting one as well. If they don't go 50 now, they've got a bit of a problem, haven't they? Absolutely. They ease financial conditions. <laughs> And where does that well, leave them okay. in this fight against inflation? Thank you. The, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, 0.33, it became more accommodative yesterday. I did not expect that when I got up from the surveillance I'm, su I'm surprised by that. Surprised. I'll have to look yeah. at the number myself, Tom. Is that actually what it says? Yeah, it's, and right now it's 0.33, but the answer is we went more accommodative as we go into this data. I'm not sure I'd call this bond market accommodative at the front end of the curve right now, that's for it's sure. uncharted turf. This is Bloomberg. Where do you start in this market after yesterday? Let's start with equities. Your stock market looks like this. Futures. I don't think we can even call this a bounce. Up two-tenths of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq up a third of 1%. To Lisa's point, a 1.6% move lower on the S&P 500. 
looks pretty resilient compared to what we saw in the bond market. Look at twos, tens and thirties, your two year through 5% for the first time since 2007. This has basically had now a 100 basis point move off the lows of Feb 2nd. A 100 basis point move at the front end of the curve on a two year. And you've now got two year, 10 year inversion breaking through 100 basis points. The curve has not been this inverted since 1981. It's been that long. If you look at the rest of the curve, the 30 years really not done much at all. 387.30, that screams a harder landing in the last 24 hours. In the FX market, euro dollar. DXY just had its best day going back to early November of last year. Euro dollar back in 105 territory, 105.37 and negative one tenth of 1% on the session, TK, as we look at not just higher for longer, but faster as well. Faster as well, and it's faster. How do we get back to where we've got to get back to? And the answer is, John, I'm going to go to what the pros go to, which is the real yield. And the answer is the inflation-adjusted yield is maybe the one thing we can latch on to with all the uncertainty and the confusion uh, that we have. I did a very careful study off the Bloomberg today of the five-year, not the 10-year, which is the vanilla real yield, the five-year in closer real yield, John. And if you go back to before the chaos... It was roughly, on a moving average basis, 2.13%. We're now at 1.78%. We've made a lot of it back, but there's more to go to get to the goal that, Jer that Jerome Powell, the governor of the Bank of England, Lagarde, and the rest want. We're not there yet. At least I mentioned Rick Reader of BlackRock. Rick Reader opening the door to suggest, I'm not saying it's his base case, but at least floating the idea that perhaps we could go to six. The reason he's suggesting that is because we're finding out through this process that maybe this economy is a lot more resilient, less interest rate sensitive than we all thought it was 12 months ago. And with that in mind, Tom, to your chart, if you had said 1% 12 months ago, some people would have pushed back and said we can't take 1% positive <laughs> real yields. And here we are, Tom, looking at two. We have lived here before, and I do want to emphasize that people that are more quiescent are saying high inflation solves high inflation. And let's remind ourselves in the chaos to Friday at 8.30 that there's people like Ed Hyman, David Rosenberg, and others that say service sector inflation will flatten and then we'll come in and disinflate with the goods and disinflation we're seeing right now. They wish it was that simple, don't they? They don't know Over the these central banks. They don't know the timeline. They're also incredibly concerned about the psychology of higher inflation becoming entrenched. Yes, and yeah. that's something that they worry about. And I imagine they believe the clock is ticking, too, which speaks to this <clears throat> faster point, right? Get up, get to sufficiently respect, restrictive as fast as you can. Yeah. And I'd sit here and say, well, where is sufficient I, I, look, restrictive? I, I, Do they have any idea? And, and Radio John, you don't see this, folks. We've got the Two's Tens banner up on TV. John, a negative 107 beeps? Yeah. Like, that was supposed to be, like, back to school this fall. It's early 80s <laughs> stuff. It's it's nuts. That's where we are. <clears throat> Let's do this now. We do it with someone steeped in economic history. When you're at the University of Bath, as John Farrow says it, and you need history, you go over and look at the Roman ruins. Sharon Bell has done that with Goldman Sachs, European equity strategist, this morning. How did Goldman Sachs off the London desk synthesize yesterday's festivities in Washington? Sharon, how did Goldman Sachs London adjust? Oh, I, I agree with your comments. I feel that the adjustment we've seen in markets has been quite small, given the news that we have from Powell that, um, you know, their view would be that they need to tighten a bit further in a way in order to um, to, to push in those inflationary um, trends down and, and stop inflation becoming a bit more embedded. We've increased by 25 basis points our view on where the Fed terminal rate will be. We expect them to keep hiking all the way through to July. We're now looking for five and a half to five and three quarters. Um, so I've been a bit surprised at the lack of reaction, I guess you could say, yes. in risk, risk assets, assets like equities. Yeah, I saw that yesterday, and the VIX really not moving right now. 19.59, it's got a 21, 22 feel. Uh, we're not there. So within equities, Sharon, when you talk to Peter about how you bifurcate equities given what is going to come, is it profit-making and non-profit-making? What are the factors that matter in what to own in equities? Yeah, it's tricky. We think equity returns from here will be quite low because you've got this kind of... <laughs> non-ideal environment. You've got rates going up and you don't have pr 
a lot of progress on earnings. Um, so that combination is not brilliant generally for equity markets. Um, and valuation, particularly of the US market, still looks quite expensive. So where do you go? Um, I mean, Europe probably looks a little bit better than the US because um, uh, you are, you're seeing growth pick up in China with the reopening and Europe has a lot of exposure to Asia and China. Um, and also Europe has lower value stocks too, which suffer less in a higher rate environment. So I would be looking at more value ends of the market. Um, commodities have been a little bit left behind in all of this as well. I would have expected a stronger commodities market year to date. We think as global demand picks up later in the year, and particularly with China reopening, um, you'll see commodity prices rise again. So perhaps some stocks exposed to that and then more value areas like financials. Sharon, has the trade with respect to European equities already been played out, especially because we've already seen the reopening kind of enthusiasm around China, and we just got data kind of was throwing some cold water on this feeling that perhaps the Eurozone could avoid some sort of recession or stagflation with the Eurozone economy failing to grow in the fourth quarter? Look, I don't think Europe is going to run away with fantastic growth. Um, and I do agree with you, European markets have done well year to date. But I think there is a big difference between Europe and the U.S., um, than, and that is valuation. Um, U.S. companies trade on average, the S&P trades on about 18 times PE. Europe trades on 12 to 13 times PE. So there's this big gap between the two. I think that you're not pricing so much into European equities, even with the rally we've had year to date. The other thing to note is European earnings have been quite resilient. Um, so the fourth quarter earnings season was quite good. Yes, the economy may, may not be all that strong, but the earnings of European companies have been reasonably resilient. So that resilience and low valuation makes us feel a little bit more positive. But I don't want to overemphasize this point. We have very low returns in Europe, too, for equities this year. How vulnerable are uh, some of the big corporations in Europe to a euro that could depreciate if the U.S. truly does surprise to the upside with respect to the pace and to the level of rate hikes? Yep. And look, I think it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you could say euro depreciation is good for European companies. They're very, very global in their mix. Um, only 40% of their sales are domestic to Europe, 60% are outside. A lot of that is dollar earnings. So if the dollar is going up, you're making much more earnings um, when you translate that back into euros. So fantastic. But actually, generally, you're totally right. There's a positive correlation between European equities and the euro. The euro is going up. People are more risk on. They believe that growth is going to be better in Europe, and they tend to yeah. invest in European assets. Sharon, there's a drinking game when I ask this question, so get your tang out right now. Sharon, I, it's real simple here. I see higher inflation. Maybe I see some GDP growth, maybe like what we see in Japan, which sums up to a more vibrant nominal GDP. Does that fold over to a missed revenue guess, where revenues do better than your modeling? And that does seem to have been the case. Um, I, and although I wouldn't just say revenues, um, margins have held up much better than we expected and than our models would have predicted last year. Um, so we've been surprised on both counts that the top line has been a bit better than expected. I agree that's related to nominal growth, but companies have been able to pass on a lot of the cost additional costs that they've been seeing through to the consumers, whether that be businesses, other businesses or, or households, consumers. So um, margins have been a bit more robust as well. And I think that's been a bit of a surprise to us in Europe particularly. So I think if it's back to this point about European earnings being a little bit more resilient, being very, very global in their nature, those things are good. Um, but of course, what's unhelpful is, is rising interest rates. Sharon, before I let you go, you talk about the exposure to Europe, uh, to the reopening in China. And we talk about this as a positive for growth. And at the same time, here in the U.S., we talk all about this geopolitical risk. It's sort of a catch-all phrase that people uh, use to talk about the increasingly fiery rhetoric between the U.S. and China. How do you express concern about some sort of regulatory pushback in companies in Europe that are very exposed to China that could get hit by some of this? Or do you just basically shrug it off and say it won't happen? Yeah, look, I think that there is a view generally that um, having a, a kind of wide international spread is not such a bad thing. Um, you get, you know, some economies are growing, some economies are, are weakening, and you've got a, a broad spread um, of exposure. But having just purely a China exposure pocket, that does leave you very open to geopolitical risk, to China, to supply chain risk, etc. So people are aware of that. I think most of the companies with exposure to China are very global in their mix. So they're not just solely focused on China. Sharon, wonderful to hear from you. Again, Sharon thank Bell you. of Goldman. Sharon, thank you. Said this a few times to Sharon.
over the last few months. But I remember she joined the programme a number of months ago and said, get long European banks. And I pulled that face, that face where, you know, I'm like, what are you talking about, you European banks? I've never seen that. That's, that's, I've that's never ridiculous. seen that. And that face, I, I pulled that face a few times over the years. Uh, and often they, the individual becomes right and I have to take it back and say that face wasn't deserved. Yeah. Bank stocks in Europe are up more than 20% year to date. They have ripped off, off the, the lows yeah. of last summer. Yeah. It's been phenomenal to see. I don't have a strong call on what they do from here, but let's be clear, on a ratio basis and with the ample dividend, they're priced still way below the American profit-making and dominant banks. I think we've got to talk about surveillance entertainment here. And I think on the commercial banks, we got to go big little like the sports programs. What would you like to do? I'd like to have the camera on us or even have the ads in silence okay. so they can hear Would you us like us to line up before the show and sing as well? We no, I don't do want to do too. that. They don't this need is to see my before, European before the bank champ, face. Before the Champions this is, League. I think I'm pulling out your European bank face <laughs> yeah. to that suggestion. You know, when we sort of all shake hands before the game starts. <laughs> what are we talking place. about? Really? Well, with Tom's who? thinking about with doing, the, doing with, sort of a sport type broadcast. Would we shake hands with each other? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. producer. What was the highlight yesterday? What was the highlight yesterday? What of? Anna Hahn making clear Team Mercedes is going to do better. In Saudi Arabia. Oh, she's a Lewis Hamilton fan. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's what the show's about. It's like F1 overload at the moment on this <clears throat> program. It isn't is it? F1 overload. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That side of the table. <laughs> Christian Horner. Not on that side. Christian Horner. I Red Bull emailed me. Said Tom enough. <laughs> <laughs> Asselinos is coming up from RBC Capital Markets. Looking forward to catching up with her on foreign exchange. Big move in the US dollar yesterday. Dollar stronger. Euro dollar back to 105. The bond market is just where the entertainment is. It depends where you are in equities, whether you find it entertaining or not. I guess. Close to 4% on a 10-year. We really didn't do much on a 10-year yield yesterday. The heavy lifting at the front end of the curve, the two-year, through 5% for the first time since 2007. This morning, we add some more weight to yes. it, up around about three basis points going into Chairman Powell Day 2. Yesterday, in front of the Senate Banking Committee, a little bit later this morning, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, in front of the House Financial Services Committee. That's coming up a little bit later. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In less than five weeks, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has changed his tune. On February 1st, Powell said the disflationary process had begun. But on Tuesday, he told the Senate committee the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than anticipated. Powell said he's ready for faster monetary tightening if economic data justifies it. In the UK, Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt may give companies extra tax relief on investment spending. Hunt's looking for measures to boost economic growth in his spring budget. He's under pressure to act because Britain's flagship corporate tax break expires on April 1st. Ukraine says that a European Union proposal to buy $1.1 billion of ammunition isn't enough. The country's defense minister says Ukrainian forces need about four times as much. The EU's defense ministers have given their cautious backing to sending ammunition, ammunition to Ukraine from existing stock. The White House has endorsed a bill in Congress that could give the president authority to ban or force the sale of TikTok. That could break a deadlock over how to address privacy concerns around the popular Chinese-owned app. Now, the bill doesn't mention TikTok, but the video sharing app is the clear target. It has about 100 million users in the U.S. And Silvergate Capital is in talks with U.S. regulators on ways to salvage the troubled crypto-friendly bank. Bloomberg has learned one possible option FDIC officials are discussing includes lining up crypto industry investors to help Silvergate shore up its liquidity. Regulators arrived at the firm's La Jolla, California offices last week. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think the Goldilocks um, scenario that we see is the least probable of the outcomes. And it's really what the market's been pricing uh, at the start of this year, the U.S. equity market. It's this idea that we do get this uh, gradual fading of inflation and the Fed are able to engineer this no landing or soft landing. We still get robust growth. We don't get a collapse in margins. We still expect to see a recession um, this year. 
Our economists have pushed that back one quarter from Q2 to Q3. That was Greg Battle there, the US head of equity and derivative strategy <laughs> over at BNP Paribas. I think he felt good yesterday, <laughs> he didn't he? Good day. So Greg and the team are looking for 575 on <clears> rates. That's Carl Ricardona's call. We're just south of that in terms of what we're pricing for the peak rate in this rate hiking cycle. So far. And he's looking at 3,400 on the S&P 500 year end. I mean, we got closer yesterday, but we're still a while away, aren't we, <laughs> on mean... the S&P 500. To your point, Bramo, you said it a couple of times already this morning. I think a lot of people will sit here and say, you know what, that resonates with me. We saw a big move in the bond market, some real milestones that we <clears> haven't <throat> hit in decades, looking at that yield curve inversion, a two-year through 5% for the first time since 07. And yet equities down 1.6%. And I looked at high yield spreads at the close yesterday. Nothing. What? Dead flat. Totally unchanged. You're not Why? seeing that. Why? Basically, people, I honestly can't explain it. Honestly, if I gave you a real explanation, I'd be lying. There is a feeling that perhaps this economy is more resilient to higher rates. And if that's the case, then you could see rates go higher without a commensurate It'll downturn in the economy. And yeah. actually, <clears throat> HSBC pointing this out, if you take a look at 10-year yields south of 4%, that's indicating a soft landing. That's indicating that rates will remain higher, that we're not going to crash in some sort of uh, phenomenal way. And they're looking for those yields to go down because they think that's perhaps too optimistic. John, a break. You said something really, really important. And all this I said a lot of folks, things. Don't share some of it, though. <laughs> oh, God. There's a, there's a fly over here on the wall. Um, be selective here, TK. I'm going to be selective here <laughs> and say, John nailed it. And what you need to know this morning, folks, in this true turmoil as we go to the chairman's further comments today, we further steepened this morning. I think that's not in the zeitgeist this morning as we've moved forward from the shock of yesterday to further inversion. Yeah, another three basis points on a two year. I know this curve is inverted by. <clears throat> Another three basis points deeper, deeper inversion, Tom, 107. Yeah. Two's tens, 107. Look at that. Do you remember when Priya Misra came on the show from TD a number of months ago and said, negative 50? Laughed we were like, wow, negative yeah. 50. Yeah. Negative 50 sounds crazy. Where's the equity market going to be? And here we are at negative 107 basis points on a two-year yeah. versus the 10-year. Shout out to Ira Jersey, who also extended out from something that was measured 60, 70 beeps out to 80, 90, and now 100 uh, basis points on the difference between the two and the 10-year. It is a perfect time to talk to Elsa Lingos, yes, global head of FX strategy at RBC, but far more schooled on the interdependencies, the dynamics of our major central banks. Elsa, an open question as you try to figure out what to write about this weekend. How linked are the central banks right now? Oh, it's a great question, Tom, because actually that's one thing that really stands out about some of the moves here to date. In relative terms, we haven't actually seen particularly big moves. A lot of this is happening in sync. So you have the Fed being repriced, you have the ECB being repriced, you even have the Bank of Japan being repriced. It does make for a very interesting market where most of the cues for FX are coming from asset class interplays rather than relative movements. Does the dollar move up? Higher U.S. interest rates, I need to own dollars. Can we see a foreign flood into a strong dollar trade? So we've got a framework we've been using for more than a year now that we find really helpful in predicting asset class um, and currency movements. And it's really thinking about that interplay between bonds and equities. So when we see bonds and equities selling off together, as we did for a lot of last year, as we did in February, we tend to see very strong dollar environment. Equally, bonds and equities rallying together, the tail end of 2022, start of this year, um, is weakness for the US dollar. And when you're in this kind of no man's land, you end up just going for more of those relative value trades in effect which is where we are at the moment. I fear for the Bank of Canada today, Elsa. It's actually probably one of the more interesting aspects of today amid a slew of news items, because if Bank of Canada does come out and do as expected and pause the rate hiking cycle, this could potentially be really negative for their currency. How closely are you watching this in terms of understanding the pressure that the Fed is putting on other central banks right now? It's a great question, Lisa, because I think a lot of people expect the Bank of Canada to have to follow the Fed almost slavishly, given the very strong economic ties between the U.S. and Canada. And yet, sometimes, the U.S. actually does the work for the Canadians. And so they almost have to do a little bit less at the margin. And yes, the currency may take a hit um, as a result. But the forward curve, to a large degree, has been priced for that pause from the bank. We only really have one more hike in the forward curve at the moment. So I don't think it should be too big a shock to currency markets if the Bank of Canada does stick to that conditional pause for now. If that's the case, then on the margins, do you just see more dollar strength going forward than perhaps people have been expecting, not just versus the Canadian loonie, but also with respect to 
especially what we see with the euro, with what we expect, uh, what we see in particular over uh, in Asia, where a lot of the reopening trade has already been priced in. Yeah, so, you know, we did start the year when bearishness on the dollar was very popular. Um, we did start the year perhaps a little bit more cautious. Um, we were looking for some dollar weakness in Q1, probably not quite as much as we saw. And yet, as the year plays out, it's hard to really get carried away by the bearish dollar trend. That's not to say we're massive dollar bulls. It's just I don't think 2023 is going to be the mirror image of 2022. You know, whereas last year was all about strong dollars, this year for me is not all about weak really much nuanced than that. And to really make a decision on that, I think you have to get into the individual currencies. We still like dollar yen higher. We still like a lot of CAD crosses rather than just outright long or short dollars. Given this sort of no man's land, this chop that you're talking about with the dollar, and also the idea of an economy that likely will deteriorate near the end of the year, how concerned are you about the developing world, especially given the scarcity of dollars and some of the concerns that have been coming to light over the past few months? Yeah, it's an interesting moment, right, because we had the announcement over the weekend from Chinese authorities setting a growth target that was definitely at the low end of people's expectations, around 5 percent, certainly no payback for the weakness in growth we saw last year. Trade data earlier this week from China, again, not seeing signs of that big import boom that some were expecting. It's still early days, um, but it doesn't look like a picture where the rest of the world is going to be booming in growth and it's just the U.S. slowing down in isolation. Outside a number of months ago, I was in London and asked a very simple question to a lot of guests. I said, who's going to hike more this year, the ECB or the Fed? The consensus was overwhelming. Pretty much everyone said the ECB. Alistair, where are you on that question now? It's a great question, isn't it? I mean, don't get me wrong, the ECB still have a lot of work to do as well. But I think, I know you and I have discussed this before on the show, John. The fact is that the US was sick stronger heading into the pandemic. It delivered more in terms of stimulus, both fiscal and monetary, and it's cyclically stronger coming out of the pandemic. Yes, it has tightened a lot more than the ECB, but there's a good reason for that. The ECB um, was not in the same position as the Fed at the start of this year. Asselinos of RBC, kind of skirting that question just a little bit <laughs> there, Tom. I mean, I don't blame her. That was <laughs> I don't, the, I really, that was I really a don't lingo slide. Yeah, I don't blame that. her. I wasn't going to push well back too hard. Well schooled in Brussels. It's really difficult to answer right now. If Holtzman of the Austrian Central Bank has his way, they're going another 200 basis points at the ECB. I'm not sure that's where the consensus is. But the idea we get close to six of the Federal Reserve felt kind of crazy a couple of months ago. It doesn't feel as crazy anymore. I'm not saying it's a base case for people, but certainly the probability around that I, view has shifted. Ibrahim Rabari... Citigroup, the level of data dependency is off the chart. We have never seen it because, you know, I, we're making a joke about it all s this morning, but on a theory basis, this is uncharted territory. There is no theory right now. Let's well, just wait for the data. You know what we're not talking about today? <clears throat> long and variable lags. Nobody's talking about long and variable lags. Yeah, that happened yesterday yeah. afternoon. <laughs> well, no, but this but is actually important, right? Because 5. there is a feeling of <clears throat> a lack of patience, right? There hasn't been the progress made. You are seeing revisions to the upside, not what this Federal Reserve wants to see. That patience is off the table. So all of a sudden, you have to start wondering, okay, well, then is the balance of risks going too far at that point? Because they're not considering that at this point. He touched on it briefly yesterday in the testimony. I think to your point, it's worth considering that 12 months ago, I don't think we've even had the anniversary of the first rate hike yet, have we? I think it's 12 months ago we were still at zero and we were still I... doing QE. <clears throat> it's only 12 months later. I think the shift has happened because people thought we'd price in higher rates and the pass through to the real economy would be faster than it's turned out. And certainly in the rate sensitive parts of this economy, you can see it. It's just not spreading it in spreading through in quite the same way. And it's not consistent. I mean, yesterday we saw a big pop in used car prices. In some measures, <sighs> the biggest pop going back to 2009 on a month over month basis. This is sort of a reinflation of some of the good sectors that previously had been the, the source of the disinflationary process. This is confusing. So how do you come up with some sort of sense of whether we're making progress on diminishing inflation? Yeah, I'm with Tom as well, though. This can all change Friday morning. Totally Where are agree. we going to be on March 14th, which is when CPI comes out, more at 8.31 Eastern Time? You Just a minute it's... after that print. <laughs> you think that's more important than jobs? I think inflation right now is more important than jobs because I have no idea what the revision is going to be to that shock half a million number. Yeah. I have no idea what the revisions are going to be. Can you imagine how the story I'm changes? Ignorant. You get a big revision to yeah, I'm, January I'm, I'm date. Uh, and everyone's like, oh. Pause. <clears throat> OK. My answer is I'm going to listen to Michael McKee. <laughs> Features up a tenth on the S&P. Coming up, Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods.
Our leading indicators continue to signal recession. Indeed, they say that recession should be happening right about now. This is clearly an economy that's proving to be more resilient than a lot of people expected. I think people came into this year feeling as if the recession was inevitable, and that no longer is the case. We see the market getting down to 3,400, but then potentially flatlining through the second half of the year. We do think that equities can drop lower, but for us, it would take a lot to see those October lows again. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Hello, 5%. Allow me to introduce you to six. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Equity futures up by a tenth of 1%. Your two-year yield through 5% for the first time since 2007. And Tom, some people out there thinking out loud, maybe this Fed has to go to six. Well, that's out there, and it was an adjustment yesterday. I don't know, John, what was it, 10.04 a.m., 10.03 a.m., who's counting here? And as we said earlier, the adjustment continues this morning is the headline. But how does the equity market adjust? I think that's a major mystery we'll discuss in this hour. We will talk about the uh, resiliency of the equity market in the face of this 100 basis point move at the front yeah. end of the yield curve. <clears throat> In a single month, this has happened really, yeah. really quickly. It's Chair Powell, all, day two. I don't want to – Chairman Powell, day two. First of all, does he walk it back? I have no idea. But what's interesting to me, to borrow from the great mathematician Clifford Asnes, Cliff Asnes of the hedge fund world and AQR, you see the divide between bond volatility and equity volatility. There's some noise there. I don't want to go into it. I haven't had the third cup of tang. You know what? It's massive the way bonds are looking at this versus the way equities are looking. I'm going to say it all week going into Friday morning and onto March 14th. Everything we talk about is so highly dependent, Lisa, on payrolls on Friday and then CPI next week. Highly dependent in the rate market, the stock market and the credit market, I have no clue. Because just to build on what you guys are talking about, the Nasdaq outperformed yesterday. The Nasdaq did better than the S&P, the tech-heavy index the that typically was the most <laughs> sensitive to rates. What do you take away from this? I can't explain it. I honestly, you pick your narrative. Maybe people are saying job cuts are right-sizing these companies, that people have already priced in higher rates. Yep. I don't know. I can believe whatever narrative people want to sell me because, honestly, I don't really understand well, this. Let's see if that narrative stands up to the next five minutes. <laughs> exactly. So. That's a fair point, too. All over the place. Let's whip through it for you. Equity futures still just about positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. The Fed chair spoke yesterday. He'll speak again this morning. Lisa will give you the time of that in just a moment. Just want to sit on the bond market just for a second. We've got a 10-year at 397. Yield's not doing much there. Yield's doing something at the front end. Your two-year up another three basis points, 5.04%. The difference between a two-year and a 10-year is now negative 107 basis points. Tom, we have not seen this yeah. since 1981. Let's not bury it in the math right now, but folks, the pros look at other spreads than the difference between between the two-year and the 10-year. And, John, they're even more dramatic, more historic. Lisa, big moves in the last 24 hours. Let's see if they're repeated today. Uh, day two of Fed Chair Jay Powell on Capitol Hill testifying to the House uh, Financial Services Committee. Do we get a sense of doubling down? My suspicion is probably since, as John pointed out, it was in his written statement. Tom Barkin of the Richmond Fed mm. is going to be speaking here in about an hour. Today, we also get a Bank of Canada decision. And I actually think this is going to be interesting at 10 a.m. They're moving in the opposite direction of the Federal Reserve. They're expected to pause their rate hikes. So do you see the carnage in the Canadian dollar? Do you see some sort of read-through in terms of the widening divergence? And today, in terms of data dependency, again, which data matters most? I'm guessing ADP employment data, 815, oh, not on. among them. But no, I do you think that U.S. Doing that just for me. <laughs> well, I mean, look, no. people are going to take whatever tea leave. We, we talk about this every time we no. get ADP. People come out and they say it doesn't matter, it's not relevant, and then people trade off it. And we get U.S. Jolt's uh, job opening data at 10 a.m., which also people yes. would say is noisy, is backward-looking. It's for the month of January. Does it really matter? It's messy. People post jobs that they don't actually fill. Yeah. And yet when it goes up, everyone freaks out, and all of a sudden we're talking 6 Professor McKee rates. has lectured me that Jolt has say? value. Yeah. Let's leave oh, it. Oh, well, Jay Powell has lectured yeah. us that Jolt has value. Well, Powell so. got it from McKee. <laughs> it's, it's always noisy if it doesn't speak to um, you in the way you'd like it to speak to you. Right? <laughs> Everyone's true. like, mm, you know, the data worked last year. Then this year, they're like, yeah, can we just talk about the survey responsive to the economic data? <laughs> exactly. We think we've got a problem there. OK. Sarah Hunt, chief market strategist at Alpine Saxon and Woods, joins She's us now. Medicated. Sarah, wonderful <laughs> to have you with us this morning. Thanks for being us. I'm sure it was a long day yesterday working through some of this. Lisa's made the point repeatedly this morning. We can sit here and look at that move of 1.6 percent on the S&P and make a big hoo-ha about it. Do you think that's somewhat resilient in the face of what we're seeing develop in the bond market? 
I think it's very resilient. I mean, you look at what's gone on in the last, you know, you just look at where rates are and the equity markets are sort of like, OK, we're fine. We touch the resistance. We're, I mean, we touch support. We're good. And I have to look at that and go, if we're really going to be longer, higher for longer and how high we get is, is also right now up in the air. But if we're going to stay there for not a period of months, but a period of years, which somebody mentioned earlier this morning, I don't think the markets are pricing that in. I mean, earlier this year, they were pricing in cuts by the by September. Right. So I think this is part of the reason why you're not seeing the reaction in things like housing prices, because if the expectation is rates are going to come right back down again, then I don't need to adjust my sales price because of higher mortgage rates. I think that we haven't really baked in that rates might be much higher than we've expected for a long period of time because we just had 10 years of zero rates. It's very hard for people to wrap their heads around. Okay, so let's talk about the balance of risks. Is it more likely that rates markets are histrionic and going bonkers and are totally wrong or that stocks just are not waking up to the reality that we're not going back to 2018? B. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I, I, I think that that the rates markets tend and bonds tend to not be as histrionic as equity markets, relatively speaking. And I think that there is just a lack of appreciation for how much higher rates are going to make a difference over a longer period of time. I think you're already seeing it. You start you, the last two months you saw credit expansion by people is going down. Right. So what does that mean? People are buying less cars and non revolving credit. I think that people are starting to change their behavior. But I think that that does take some time. And this is that whole argument about what are the lags and how what happens here. But we've only had higher rates for barely a year. So it's I think it's really the, the, for people to change their behavior takes some time. So what's the clarifying moment where all of a sudden we get a narrative and people say, oh, my God, the sky is falling. I don't know that we get a sky is falling narrative so much as we get a you're not going to go back to the free money that you were getting. So so just get over waiting for that to happen again. Right. Like that is the I think it's more about that and, and learning to live with higher rates. There are a lot of arguments about how much whether or not governments can afford higher rates, what's going on with all the balances on, on everyone's balance sheet. But I think that in the end, if you get a rate structure that's above the zero that we just lived with for the last decade, there's more of a ability for people to use fixed income in their portfolios, which they hadn't been able to really use before. And yeah. there's just a difference in how people are borrowing money and how and whether companies can just, you know, money is not free anymore. You write about the soothing narratives that are out there for the equity market. We've covered Meta was the Facebook was the stock du jour yesterday on boardrooms dealing with a soothing narrative. How are corporations and boardrooms going to adjust the soothing reality that we have. Well, you've made an interesting point over and over again, which is that corporations adjust, right? So people, this is also where earnings might not fall off. We're a up to clip. 42 viewer <laughs> folks they, they, they on radio and TV combined. So just to be clear, 42 viewers. Yeah, I was about to say. Adjust, adjust, that's adjust, what I was thinking. Too. Okay, they adapt too. So they, they will figure that out. I don't think the corporate balance sheets are in terrible shape. Celebratory tang. <laughs> I think you have some corporate balance sheets that need that are in bad shape. But for the most part, corporate balance sheets are in pretty good shape and they have other ways of raising money at equity valuations here. I can also raise equity. Right. So it's not they're not the problem. Well, I think the problem is people who are not used to paying higher interest rates on their credit card balances, on their mortgages, on everything else. And that consumer is going to be more stressed, I think, than they are right you now. You nailed the secret. I, I come in. I get in way before Lisa. I got in before Lisa today. And which he is waited amazing. for me at, at my seat to shame me. I, yeah, I got out of the Bentley and I said, See, please wait, Abraham is today. coming It was a building. long story. It was Uber. Sarah, oh. Sarah th th this is really important. I went in yesterday morning early and looked at the capital structure of Apple Computer, small startup stock. <laughs> They're grossly under -debted. To me, the surprise is with high coupons, corporations go out and begin to debt up here just, just to get back to some semblance of normal before 2006. Could we see a lot of corporate issuance here, even with these high coupons? I think you've started to see it. I know that earlier this morning somebody was talking about how much money corporations were raising. But to the extent that corporations might believe that the Fed will stay higher longer and that if they don't raise money now, they may have to pay more for it later. Or if the curve uninverts or we get any kind right of right there, like, curve uninverts, then you have to then you have a bigger <clears throat> issue about raising money. OK, you've got to pick names, you've got to pick some stocks. What do you like right now? So I know this is going to sound tired, but I still like energy. I think that there's some fluctuations there. But I think, you know, you look at something like a Devon with a 9% <coughs> yield because they're paying a variable dividend. You look at something like Chenier. I, we like the LNG there story. We, go. we think that there is a longer term. You've got to change in what's going on in Europe, right? That Nord Stream pipeline isn't coming back. So you're going to have to have more LNG globally. So I think that the, that infrastructure play has some interesting things that are going on there. And there's some ways to play that in the stock market. We also think defense, even though it's expensive here, I mean, expensive at 18 times. Defense, are we really getting any safer? Is the world getting any less 
less problematic and are we spending less money on defense? Is Boeing a defense stock? I think Boeing is more tied to the commercial market right now than it is to the defense markets. I mean, I think that the perception of Boeing is much more tied to their commercial business than it is to the defense business. So I don't think it acts as much like a defense stock as some of the straight up defense stocks. But you're seeing more money spent on defense. And we just went through a whole bunch of munitions in, in Ukraine and Europe. So I think that that is something where you have some surety of income coming in. And I think that's going to be the big question. Where can I look for reliable, where I can see the sales coming in? I know that it's not going to be a big change. But just to finish on energy, do you need the underlying commodity to participate or do these levels work? I think these levels work, but the problem is when it fluctuates, right? So natural gas came down from eight, which was very high, to two and change, which is very low. But that's where I think you're getting an opportunity on some of the energy stocks because you do have these big fluctuations in the underlying commodity. And if you can pick them up when you have those downtrends, then I think you longer term, if you can sit with that, with that volatility, I think you still have a pretty good long term story. Sarah, final question. Does the Fed end the year closer to five or six? Oof, I think we're half going to have to say, oh, that's a tough, but is it going to be higher than five and a half? I, I, I think we sit kind of right there. I don't really know, because I think that this is also where are we going to jump to 50? I don't know. I think I think 25s make more sense. I think the market would be too shocked by that. But I think that's part of what you saw yesterday. Sarah Hunt, thank you. A Vampire Saxon Woods. What a change we've seen. Thanks for being in New York, too. What a change we've seen in the last few months. I want to pick up on what Sarah just said. It would shock the market to go 50. Will it? I think that right now, I wonder if the market's baking that in, if they're basically saying, OK, you basically said 50. It upends a lot. It upends a lot. What's the trajectory look like from there? They go 50. What's the next one like? They have to go 50 again. They drop down and yeah, then risk flip flopping again. <clears throat> it's a real credibility issue attached to this. You know, they like to say we're not in the business of forward guidance. We want to go month <laughs> by month. They're in the business of forward guidance. They like to keep that glide path smooth. They wanted to step down and stay there. Do they don't want to smooth, step back up. How do you have a smooth glide path if the data isn't smooth, if this economy isn't smooth, if the recovery isn't smooth? Risk management. Risk management. What do you think the bigger risk is? They started to embrace the disinflationary story early. I tell my kids, you know, sometimes I just oh, have to go. embrace chaos. And I wonder at what point <laughs> they just embrace chaos. Tell me about these Uber problems. <laughs> I'm talking, Let's just move on. All right. She's talking monetary <laughs> policy to her kids. I'm talking pitch perfect. That's the difference in the house. Equity Futures up a tenth from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Bond traders have boosted bets that the Federal Reserve will speed up the pace of interest rate increases. That's after Fed Chair Jerome Powell testified before a Senate committee. Powell told lawmakers he's ready for faster monetary tightening if economic data justifies it. Interest rate swaps indicate traders see a half point hike is much more likely this month. President Biden's new spending plan will include what officials call one of the nation's biggest peacetime defense budgets ever. The total will exceed $835 billion. It includes big increases for weapons buying and research and development. In the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, riot police used tear gas and water cannons to disperse protesters unhappy over a so-called foreign agents bill. The measure would curb the influence of groups that rely on funding from the U.S. and Europe. Critics fear Georgia is sliding away from the EU and NATO and increasingly pro-Russian. Bloomberg's learned that Boeing is close to a deal to sell at least 20 of its 737 MAX planes to Japan Airlines. Talks are ongoing and a final decision has not been made. A Boeing win would be a setback for Airbus and its A320 Neojet. The German sports shoemaker Adidas has slashed its dividend and shaken up management. New CEO Bjorn Golden is personally replacing the head of global brands. Meanwhile, Golden is floating the idea of selling the $1.3 billion of Yeezy gear and donating the profit to charity. Adidas halted sales after cutting ties with a rapper known as Ye. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Fed's goal is to slow inflation. If you hit your projections, do you know how many people who are currently working, going about their lives, will lose their jobs? Inflation is extremely high, and it's hurting the working people of this country badly. All of them, not just two million of them, but all of them are suffering under high inflation. And putting two million people out of work is just part of the cost, and they just have to bear it. Will working people be better off if, if we just walk away from our jobs and, and inflation remains well, five, six percent? Just a brilliant exchange there.
with yeah, Senator Elizabeth Warren change. and Fed Chair Jay Powell. And Senator Warren <clears> doing a fantastic job of making this Federal Reserve wear their own forecasts. They hate the debt pl dot plot. I imagine they hate the projection materials they put out now because these are the questions they're going to face. Unemployment's in and around 3.5% over the last couple of months, and they're forecasting a move to 4.6%. By the end of this year, Tom. to me, John, I'm going to go. I, I mean, it's off from what we do, markets and all that. But to me, it's just East Coast. It's ancient, ancient, 19th century, pre-1907, urban cities versus agricultural America. Now we call it Wall Street, Main Street, whatever you want to call it. That's really what this debate is about. And that's what Warren's out front on. She's asking the right questions. What's the price we've got to pay to get inflation back to target? And the price she believes we have to pay is much higher unemployment and ultimately I mean, maybe I... even a recession. And I mentioned this in the last hour. There is a sense <clears throat> from some senators, and you can feel it, that they feel like this Federal Reserve is being intellectually dishonest. Just the idea being, can you really get unemployment from three and a half close to five without causing without a recession? Pain. Without yeah. a recession. She asked, she said, there have been 12 times in the past, in recent history, where we've seen unemployment rise by a percentage point in a year. How many times did that avoid recession? You know, he said, well, you know, it's this, you know, zero, right? And so this is the question. Have they priced that in? And what does that recession look like, given what the Fed might have to do? Here's the heart of the debate. I'm in the lunchroom at Carnegie Mellon, students all around, all that, with Alan Meltzer and Marvin Goodfriend. We're chowing down mediocre Carnegie Mellon uh, food and a, and a yingling beer. And the answer is, Alan Meltzer took my head off because I told him, you can't aggregate the economy. And he said back to 1947, that's the only thing we have, Tom, is to aggregate the entire economy. And that's what Powell's saying, aggregate. And Warren's saying, wait a minute, you're going to leave half the nation behind? That's really what we're talking about. It's an about. easy line of attack for a politician anyway <clears throat> in a hearing like this, because if she's right, fantastic, she looks really good, and you get to beat up the Federal Reserve. And if she's wrong and Chairman Powell's right, it doesn't really matter, does it? It's good for the Democratic Party. They're in control. The president's in the White House. Won't make much what of a difference. What are we going to hear from Patrick Henry today? What are we going to hear from the gentleman from the Carolinas uh, today? He doesn't have the the depth of education that you have from Sherrod Brown or Warren, but he represents a huge well, voice in America. This is the reason why these hearings are a little difficult for me. There are no easy answers. This is a tough situation, and everybody agrees that inflation is way too <clears> high. It has to come down to have a stable economy and stable employment. Question is how, right? And what what Chair Powell said was the risks are balanced, are not balanced, <coughs> and right now inflation is still the preeminent risk. You can make the argument that's not the case, but I don't think many people are. The best speech Chairman Powell's done in the last 18 months was Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It stood the test of time. It stood the test of time. If you go back and read the speech, that speech has stood <clears> the test of time. The problem is he backed away from it, and not just once, not twice, three or four times. And I'd throw this in there as well. It's not the first time we've heard him since that January payrolls report. He also <coughs> did the interview with Mr Rubenstein down at the Economic Club of Washington and didn't back away from it then either. And this has been the problem with this Fed chair in the last month. I have a ton of sympathy with them. Yeah. I think that we've all been surprised <coughs> by how this economy is much, much less rate sensitive than we thought it was. But at the same time, the moment they had a sniff of the disinflationary process beginning, they embraced it and stepped down to 25. Oh. And the risk was always, and people flagged it, and I go back to what Mohammed el had said around the decision going into it. This wasn't hindsight. Going into that Fed decision, <clears throat> Mohammed turned around and said, let's go 50, because if you drop down to 25 prematurely, you run the risk of flip-flopping, and flip-flopping will cause right. more pain than is necessary. And this is where we are. Let's go to Amory Horton right now in Washington. She keeps score for us here. Amory Horton, to me, it is the greatest shift in modern politics to go from Maxine Waters, just north of Watts in Los Angeles, to Mr. McHenry of North Carolina. What an abrupt shift on the House Financial Services Committee. Who is Patrick McHenry, and why should Global Wall Street listen to him this morning? Well, he's a key ally of the Speaker McCarthy, of course, and he's an individual that I think our audience really knows about. Uh, he's been in the financial world, outspoken about these issues in Congress, 
and he's, we'll see what he has to say today when it comes to uh, <laughs> the Fed chair, Jay Powell. But what you're going to hear today from lawmakers is likely similar to what, you're, what we heard yesterday. There's going to be the issue on capital requirements on banks, climate change, who's going to be his number two. And then the most important issues, of course, is where the Fed chair sees inflation and higher rates. And Tom, something you brought up about big cities versus rural areas we should note, it wasn't just Senator Elizabeth Warren talking to him about this concern of people losing their jobs. The quote from Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana, Republican, was, you're trying to raise the unemployment rate. Are you not? That is what he said to Jerome Powell, because obviously, if people lose their jobs, this is a concern for every single lawmaker. I, I look, Anne Marie, at the festivities this morning, and I just want to know what the Republican response is. Clearly, the Democrats driving the show yesterday got the visibility. Do the Republicans fo uh, uh, focus on boring surveillance economics, or do they take a different tact? The Republicans are going to focus on issues that they want to highlight in terms of how their economic agenda is better than, say, the Democrats. So when you have the Democrats really wanting to get Jay Powell to talk about raising the debt ceiling in a very clean way, the Republicans are going to want to point to things <clears throat> like what they deem as excessive spending from this administration and how that potentially was a cause or added to the cause of inflation. So you will see these partisan issues. Also, Mike McKee and I spoke after the hearing yesterday, yesterday and the testimony yesterday, and we were both quite shocked at how many Republicans came out and talked about um, uh, the Fed Governor Barr's uh, uh, recalibration right now, looking at bank capital requirements. Almost the majority of Republicans touched on this yesterday. So clearly there are a lot of bank lobbyists that want Republicans to focus on this capital requirement. But really from the <clears throat> politics point, the Republicans are going to want to get, if they can, and he's going to be very diplomatic about it as he was yesterday, but they really want to point to federal spending and what they call excessive spending. Amory, just quickly, this is something Lisa and I want to talk about in just a moment, but the president expected <clears throat> to propose a 5.2% raise for federal employees in his budget set to be released on Thursday. This is the largest in 43 years. Now, I understand why he wants to do this, but do they acknowledge that this might contribute to the overall problem? Well, we'll see, because the president is also going to map out how he thinks they can bring the deficit down. And probably there's been a lot of calls from individuals that work in the federal <clears throat> government, which is a huge employer, because inflation is going up. They want to see their wages go up. Yeah. But whether or not it's this issue in terms of federal wages or if it's going to be uh, he's going to call for a tax over those $400,000 or going to call for quadrupling the tax on share buybacks. None of this will get through this Congress. MH, thank you. And well said. Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C. And let's be careful about framing that point being part of the problem. I mean for the Federal Reserve. I think everyone's going to want that pay rise against the well, backdrop of higher inflation, without yeah. a doubt. But this is the pass-through conversation that we're talking about. Right. This is why this can yeah. last longer than people think. I don't think. think Americans understand this. The IMF had a great bar chart in the last 42, maybe 48, maybe 78, uh, 72 hours, how alone the United States is in fiscal expansion as a COVID solution. It's shocking to look at that chart. There was a story about six months ago about members of the European Central Bank, researchers who are asking for a raise and the central bank pushing back and saying, we don't want to be part of the problem, right? And so this just sort of <laughs> highlights well, the reality where, you know, in order to maintain a quality of life, you need to have I mean, a wage increase. I mean, what's so important here, John, is we've got this event here at 10 o'clock with futures up fractionally in that. Then we have the surveillance nap, mm. and we've got to put in place what really matters now. What's that? Which is the countdown here to where AC Milan takes out the oh, tots. Let's not talk about Milan Spurs because later. AC hoping Milan, to avoid they're that. up one goal. They're up one goal right now, right? Is that the countdown clock for Milan Spurs later? Yeah, you know, we should have gone to this game. We, we, it was, we, it, should, we, it, we tried. <laughs> it was know. blocked. <laughs> wasn't approved. Wasn't approved. <laughs>
What a session yesterday. Let's pick up on some of those moves and start with the equity market. Three-day winning streak. Well, we snapped that, didn't we? Your equity market now totally unchanged on futures. We snapped that three-day winning streak yesterday on the S&P with a 1.6% move lower. The banks got absolutely hammered. The financial was underperforming. The banks down about 3.7% on the S&P. Wow. Confronting this move in the bond market, your two-year <coughs> through 5%. Percent, and we add some weight to it, up another three basis points, 5.04%. The difference between the two-year and the 10-year, more than 100 basis points, negative 107 this morning. That curve inversion gets deeper. It gets deeper with a 10-year really not doing much, Tom. Your 10-year well, right now, 396.97. Moments ago, rounded up. I'm going to do that to three digits only because Kelsey Barrow's here, negative 108 on the 210 spread. Chairman Powell opening the door to 50 basis points and driving a much, much stronger dollar as well. Euro dollar looks a little something like this on the euro side of things, just a touch weaker by a tenth of 1%. 105.39 on euro dollar. Bramo, dollar stronger, yields higher. The chair opening the door to 50, and we're at the mercy of payrolls on Friday and CPI next week. It's soup. That's what it feels like right now. It's soup. And we're going to go to actually a soup maker in just one second, Campbell Soup. Nice. <laughs> She's like, That's right. That was just perfect. <laughs> I think that, just, that I'm going to get kicked out. I'm not going to be here next week. Did you, did you have, was Campbell Soup inflicted <laughs> you upon you as a child? Hold on a second. We're getting there. Do you think there. in an Italian household, <laughs> My family ever reached for a tin of soup. Just how he gets like Gorgia. Oh, yeah. He gets like Gorgia. That is, that is, that is yeah. it's like, it's absolutely fist. sinful. All right, absolutely well, we'll get there. Sinful. A lot of other people, including my home, did reach for a tin of soup because I didn't grow up in a culinary uh, panacea and culinary heaven uh, like Jonathan Farrow. And honestly, I wish I had, but let's go there. Uh, let's start with Campbell, which is at the bottom. Those shares popping 1.7% because lots of people reach for soup and they beat expectations. You saw adjusted earnings per share at 80 cents versus a 74 cent estimate and seeing uh, better than expected net sales for the full year up to 10% of a gain versus 7 to 9%. Okay, on the margins, is that going to be considered a staple. John would say no. Other people who are classic Americana would say yes. We see WeWork shares popping 7%. Yay, but they are down 20% year to date and down 80% or more last year. So it's coming off a pretty low base. And this comes after uh, they said that they were going to be in talks to raise hundreds of millions of dollars in capital to support the business. Are we there in the adapting and adjusting phase? And Tesla, Wow, those shares down 1.3%, not the biggest move in the world, considering that U.S. auto safety regulators have opened an investigation wow. into reports of steering wheels falling off. That's not good. <laughs> I mean, it's just not what Clearly. you want to hear. They said, Clearly you know. Are good. they supposed to be a detachable? No, <laughs> no, I don't think that steering wheels I don't, wheels because like, I, I learned to be this in Formula detachable. One. They, they change them yeah, all the sure time. They're doing an F1 change. But is a Tesla got gas. a pin there where you can? No idea. I think that it's about the screw coming undone. I, I don't think you can really take car tips from Formula One. I'm just suggesting. You certainly you can me, for this show. You've got me reminiscing <laughs> about tomatoes. I still remember, and I can still smell it. Oh, here we are. A truck of tomatoes in our little town in the south of Italy coming up the road and all the nonnas leaving the high rises coming out and buying them and then we had these oil barrels out the back in the car park and you used <coughs> to take a winter's worth of tomatoes you'd cook them overnight to make the sauce they'd right. be there for days i could still smell it coming up through the balcony right. and you'd make jarred tomato sauce to get you through through the winter so what do you do year. in the aisle this that. is really important we're going to stop the show that's here. what this you do when you have important. no money in the south of italy to get through it you don't and reach for the so tin. when you go you into a whole paycheck to john months in, months in the months. summer this is important when you go into a whole paycheck in the summer and you see fancy fancy homegrown hamptons tomatoes no idea at what they're 15 dollars a pound it. how do you Forget react it. to that it's ridiculous well, or it's ridiculous I assume that it also wasn't my grandfather grew tomatoes in his backyard, and every time I went near them, don't touch them! <laughs> there was no sharing. <laughs> well, no, no, okay. I mean, there would be, but at, the, at the right time. Very different But world. not, yeah, anyway. This out. was a nice pivot. I like that. <laughs> I could tell you more stories in the future. Maybe we can do a segment. I'm on the Bloomberg only Radio. one in America who went to college and the food got better. That's how bad. <laughs> that's how bad. It's a true story, I folks. Can't. That's how bad my, my mother I can't uh, say was. say the same thing. We're lucky this morning. We've got Cassie Barrow from J.P. Morgan with us. Now, Cassie thought she'd get a clean slate, come here to speak on behalf of Bob Michael and the team. Then Bob Michael got in there first and said this to Bloomberg. So, Cassie, I've got no idea what this is about, but here's the quote from him. He thinks that if we go back to 50, 
it would be pretty confusing to the market. I hope they don't do it. I hope they're willing to run a string of 25 basis point increases. Now, Kelsey, thanks for being with us. The chairman's opened the door to 50. Mm -hmm. How problematic is that? Yeah, so if you think about the way that Powell's been communicating about getting restrictive, right, there's three dimensions to that. There's the pace, there's the level, and then there's the duration. And what... Powell has been doing for months now is saying, okay, we've hiked a lot, and so don't worry about the pace so much. It's about the level that we get to and the duration at which we stay at that restrictive level. Yesterday, he essentially threw that out the window. That is confusing. And I think the key takeaway is that if we are going to consider reaccelerating to 50 um, based on the data, and they are very data dependent, the risk of a hard landing does go up in that scenario. And the yield curve is telling you as much. What we saw yesterday, 12 basis points higher on the two year, flat on the 10 year, break evens narrower. The yield curve, twos, tens, getting to minus 100. That is the risk of over tightening that the bond market is picking up on. And that's also why you're seeing very sticky resistance on tens at 4%, which is something mm -hmm. we've been watching and saying, yeah, people are interested at bonds, even in this repricing. The yields are there, and the diversification benefits are going to become even more important if the Fed is. Uh, going towards that hard landing scenario. And ben Emmons agrees with Bob Michael. He writes this morning about the importance of the level we're at right now. Does that level indicate restriction? Does that level indicate not the drama of super restrictive, but that we're finally at levels that really click in? Well, this is obviously the debate. Now, we think that we are getting to lever levels that are sufficiently restrictive. So last year, the thing that I was always quoting was the real Fed funds rate. So saying that the Fed wasn't going to stop hiking until the real Fed funds rate turned positive. So essentially, you needed the Fed funds rate to move above the level of inflation. We are making progress on that. You know, if you look at core PC, it's around 4.6 percent. The Fed is now expected to get to five, maybe five and a half. That's going to be a significantly positive real Fed funds rate. And I think we have to think about the way in which policy impacts the economy. It impacts housing first, then manufacturing, then consumer and labor. And it's actually playing out in that traditional way. Housing, home prices have been deflating for six straight months. Uh, business investment is starting to rolling over. Now, what's only left is the consumer and the labor market. Uh, it just takes time. Uh, we have the patience as long-term investors that uh, the Fed may not have the luxury of having in this moment. Yeah, I was going to say, perhaps patience that the Fed doesn't have. Right now, I'm looking at a 10-year yield of about 4%, just under that. And you were talking about value in bonds. Are yields at this level on the longer-term debt instruments pricing in a soft landing of sorts with rates remaining higher for longer and no crash? Well, I think that with the yield curve, this inverted, you are looking at a rates market that is suggesting the risk of hard landing is rising. Now, where I think the discontinuity is, is really more in the spread market, so in credit. So spreads are still on the narrow end of the recent ranges and of history. So that's where I would say more of the complacency is. But I think in the rates market itself, I think you are seeing the risk of over tightening playing through within the very inverted yield curve. I guess uh, to put this another way, there's a feeling that even if we get some sort of recession or some sort of landing, <laughs> aside from the no landing idea that people were talking about for a while, that we're gonna have higher rates for longer. And that is a persistent theme, regardless of even a crash. Yep. Do you agree with that? Do you think that if the Fed does crash the economy, we will still end up with higher terminal rates for a longer period of time? Yeah, so it, we do think that we're in a new regime. And the starting point of that new regime was the fact that this is the first hiking cycle in 30 years that the peak of that hiking cycle is higher than the prior one, right? So we were having higher or lower highs and lower lows for 30 years. That's the bull market of fixed income. We are now going in the opposite direction. So this is a meaningful shift because the next time that the Fed cuts, we don't think it's going to be back to the zero lower bound. So there is some changes that are happening here, but those are slow moving. There are still going to be cyclical shifts in yields throughout our, our broader structural view that we could be entering into a phase of higher highs and, and higher lows. Let's pick up on that because I know Bob's given it a lot of thought as well. Kelsey, you and the team, are you thinking about repeated cycles of that? 
over the next couple of decades? Is there reason to believe we've got tailwinds for it? There are some reasons to believe, um, and obviously these are, are very abstract topics, uh, things that we're not going to know I until very, very far into hindsight. Yeah. Um, but there are tailwinds as it relates to d demographics here. Um, we think that inflation structurally um, is not necessarily going to, to struggle as much to get to that 2% level. So if you think about pre or pre covid but post gfc it was very hard for the fed to achieve two percent core pce in fact on average it was about one and a half percent so we were missing it to the downside by about 50 basis points all the time now i think you can say maybe things have started to shift because of deglobalization um, because of other factors um, that it will be easier for the fed to get to that two percent you know we're not suggesting a, a materially higher regime for inflation and rates um, but but it is one that is shifting over time. Could be the last 30 years in reverse. TK, this is a major call coming from the team. Kelsey, Bob, <clears throat> this over is. JP Morgan. And the call here is you guys aren't leveraged players, but there's a huge part of the alternative investment in fixed income market that is utilize, utilizing leverage here. Did they get hammered yesterday? Is there a misuse of leverage right now? So I think the, the strength of the move in twos yesterday clearly shows that some people were off sides. Um, and there are positions that needed Why to be, to be cleaned says, out. <laughs> How's the Austria bond doing? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Cassie, you know what? That's the perfect place to leave it. Cassie Barrow of JP Morgan Asset Management. That was golden. TK, how is that Austria bond doing? <laughs> it's, well, I can't retire other than that, John. I'm going to be here forever. You're going to be retired brutal. before me. But, you know, it's, it's brutal, but it speaks to long duration. And I'm not talking about 97 years. I'm talking about people at 11, 10, 12 years. They took some losses. But it also speaks exactly to the point that Kelsey Barrow is talking about of regime change. That We were at a time yeah. when Austria could sell a zero-coupon, 100-year bond, and people bought it and then bid it up beyond 100 cents on the dollar. No. And now we are looking at a scenario where that is absolutely out of the question and possibly will look like a complete throwback. They were the years of <clears throat> fixed income for capital returns and not for income. Exactly. It was like that hot potato you wanted to sell to a greater fall because you had no intention of holding that to maturity whatsoever. <laughs> and now I feel so sorry for the person who's just left with it. <laughs> just sort of like are you, sitting what are you there. Talking about? Tom. <laughs> <laughs> You know, waiting to the see grandchildren if will love it. Mature, 21, 21, 21 10. 10 or 21, <laughs> happy, 20. Happy something. third yeah. birthday. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Terry Holmes of Pangea coming up. Cassie, thank you. This was great. Futures down a tenth. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In less than five weeks, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has changed his tune. On February 1st, Powell said the disinflationary process had begun. But on Tuesday, he told the Senate committee the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than anticipated. Powell says he's ready for faster monetary tightening if economic data justifies it. In the UK, Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt may give companies extra tax relief on investment spending. Hunt's looking for measures to boost economic growth in his spring budget. He's under pressure to act because Britain's flagship corporate tax break expires on April 1st. The White House has endorsed a bill in Congress that could give the president authority to ban or force a sale of TikTok. Now, that could break a deadlock over how to address privacy concerns around the popular Chinese-owned app. The bill doesn't mention TikTok, but the video sharing app is the clear target. It has about 100 million users in the U.S. The embattled Adani Group has taken another step to regain investor confidence. Bloomberg's learned the conglomerate has repaid a $500 million bridge loan. Some banks had balked at the refinancing, the debt following a report from short seller Hindenburg Research in January that sent Adani assets tumbling. And the most popular place for the super rich to own a home is New York. That's according to a new report by data firm Altrada. Now, the report looks at those with a net worth of over $30 million. London finished second in the survey, followed by Hong Kong and Los Angeles. The U.S. took 14 of the 20 places on the list. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We lack, at this moment in time, a holistic interagency, whole-of-government approach. 
So instead of playing whack-a-mole on Huawei one day, CTE the next, Kaspersky, TikTok, we need a more comprehensive approach to evaluating and mitigating these threats posed by these foreign technologies from these adversarial nations. That was Virginia Senator there, Mark Warner, on the latest effort, perhaps, perhaps to take a step closer to banning TikTok. Who remembers when the former president came like this close to force on a sale to Oracle and Microsoft? Do you remember that? I remember it's that. Like, it was like years uh, ago. Yeah, it was. Like, literally it like a decade ago. I haven't talked to the senator in a while, but this guy is first class. This guy was a scrapper, a hustler out of Georgetown. He failed at business. And then he got successful with Nextel and cellular phones and all that, made a, a pot of money. But what I'll always remember was the shock of the Douglas Wilder win in Virginia, John, which was stunning at the time. This guy not only could do the tech mumbo jumbo, but he could manage winning political campaigns as well. So what do you make of this bill? I, I think they're, as the senator says, they got to get their act together and get holistic. And that's a tough thing to do. And make Join the gridlock. dots. Just co connect the dots of our technology in a nation that instinctively doesn't want to do that. I'm trying to work out if this bill really just passes the <clears throat> buck, though. To the yeah, absolutely. It's like, oh, know, yeah. There's yeah. the tools. If you need them, you make the decision. I, I thought this was going through CFIUS as well. What's happening with that, Lisa? They said they're still waiting for the full CFIUS review. So we'll see what happens. The White House has endorsed this bill, <laughs> not necessarily banning TikTok, though. Again, what is the popular pushback? I keep going back to Footloose, and I know that this is perhaps anachronous, uh, but I do wonder if there is this feeling of, you know, don't keep us down, the young people, to the politicians, the politicians saying, hey, Chinese are... Is this because Kevin Bacon did a Super Bowl commercial? Is that Maybe. what this is about? Maybe that's well, what I mean, about. I, I mean, it you know, sounds she, silly she, and flippant, but it's actually true. Like, yeah, there but, is this feeling. Right? People don't understand this. Bramo's house, they don't watch a football game, they watch a commercial. So you see Kevin Bacon on there and you're singing Kenny Loggins, right? Well, we do watch the commercials. That's all I'll say. That's it. You don't watch the game. You oh, I watch the, the game, up. but the you know the, the commercials You're there for the commercials. That's fine. Lots of people are. I mean, I'm there for it all. It's just great. There no, but, I, it's but just look, come on, don't you bed before half time. But don't you watch the commercials and you watch <clears> the best ones? You see kind of what they I appreciate are the art to. that goes into a good commercial. Exactly. The art, you know. what they're trying to appeal to. How do you convince people to eat food that poisons you? All that kind of stuff is amazing. <laughs> Love it. Even a food kick, great. my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Turn back Haynes to the signed up for this. <laughs> Maybe he's still with this. Founder of Pangea Policy joins us right now. Mr. Haynes on what's going on in Washington. Terry, i got to redux what I did with Amory Horton earlier, which is today the House Financial uh, Services Committee with Chairman Powell is a different committee. We have gone from Maxine Waters of Los Angeles out to Mr. McHenry of North Carolina. That's a wow shift. Terry Haynes, what is MAGA monetary policy? President Trump and those associated with him, like the congressman from North Carolina, what is MAGA monetary policy? Well, I, I, first time I'll disagree with the premise uh, somewhat. Uh, Mr. McHenry is a very solid conservative, uh, but I wouldn't put him uh, kind of okay. as a MAGA crowd sort of person to, to begin with. <laughs> uh, secondly, what they're, what that committee is largely going to do is uh, largely going to support uh, Powell. I, I, you'll see the same kind of split you did uh, in the Senate yesterday where Republicans will generally say, keep pushing, get the job done. Uh, Democrats will be very concerned about uh, the, you know, the impacts on the vulnerable and the less fortunate, be, be concerned about the impacts on the housing market <clears throat> and the like. And remember yeah. that the, uh, the remember that uh, progressive Democrats generally didn't want uh, Powell in place, even though the, the Biden people were right. pushing him as a, uh, a relatively dovish character. So now that uh, now that they've gone hawkish, uh, progressives right. feel free to attack. Yes, that's, that's largely what you'll see today. Terry, I was had the honor of being with Spencer Abraham the day our energy policy as a nation went down in flames. This is years and years and years ago. Can, <laughs> can we make a technology policy, or is it like energy, where we're just not going to make a TikTok policy? Uh, well, we're not going to make a TikTok policy. I think what you see is really kind of a, uh, a twofold uh, punch here. One is uh, you're seeing the ramping up of investments in manufacturing in uh, in critical areas. I mean, think about this is not a lot different from uh, what we've done in past uh, major conflicts. 
and you're going to combine that with a, uh, as Senator Warner, I think, uh, accurately says, uh, a bit more holistic approach on which technologies might be harmful technology as part of national security. On top of that, you'll still have the CFIUS process, which identifies potentially uh, the, the problematic investments. So, you know, that that's really kind of the, that's really the policy the United States is developing. Uh is it comprehensive? Uh it's comprehensive in the sense that it addresses uh, uh, difficulties, but it, that doesn't mean we're going to have a, a full bore technology policy. I think no. Terry, it seems like people are highly skeptical that the U.S. is going to ban TikTok. Pretty much everyone has come out and said they're not going to do it, especially because two thirds of American teens are on this app and and doing uh, dances and other such uh, joy. I am curious, from your perspective, then, what is the ultimate goal of this? If it's not to ban TikTok, it introduces political liability if they don't do anything and they raise the risks. Is it just to try to get a sale? No, I told people yesterday that I thought this bill uh, was 75 percent likely to become law, firstly. Um, and, you know, bills get introduced every day, and I'm usually in the business of telling people that bills don't matter. Uh, this is different. Warner and John Thune are very serious people. you got already a dozen Senate co-sponsors. you got the Biden administration falling in behind. Uh, you know, the whole idea is to is to not do a ban TikTok, ban this, ban that, but to uh, to put together a process that identifies potential threats across the board. Uh, that said, uh, I think TikTok gets banned. I mean, that's instinct and nothing but. But the uh, you know, you've already got half of the uh, half of the state governments telling uh, folks that, in addition to the federal government, telling people to uh, take the take it off devices. Uh, I think it. Uh, I think it absolutely gets banned in the end. Sure. What does a TikTok ban look like, Terry? Um, well, well, the app. Well, the app goes away. Uh, you know, it basically gets flushed out of the United States system, uh, and uh, you know, kind of the the algorithms are. Uh, you know the algorithm. The algorithms are blocked. Uh, you know that sort of thing. I mean, every technical measure uh, taken uh, to uh, make sure that it doesn't uh, infiltrate this country it gets taken. Terry, have you got any insight on just the lobbying effort taking place down in Washington at the moment? I can just imagine the team at Snapchat, Facebook, getting really excited about these developments. Terry, any insight on what that looks like right now? Well, the, you know, the teams are really forming up right now, John, firstly. Uh, the, you know, they're trying to figure out exactly uh, you know, whether this helps them or hurts them, to be honest. But the, uh, you know, one of the things that will cause a lot of people, because uh, there are a lot of people in the tech world and the lobbying world in Washington some concern, is precisely the, the broad-based nature of the Commerce Department-led review that Senators Warner and Thune have put together. And... Uh, you know, and yeah, I can see a lot of other folks uh, salivating about this, sure. But at the same time, as I, as I say, I, this legislation is not about whether or not to ban TikTok. In fact, I heard Marco Rubio say last night that he was generally supportive of what Warner and Thune were doing, but he, Rubio, has the only bill that would actually ban TikTok. So there's going to be some elbowing under the basket on that. Uh, but. Uh, you know, they're all going to be concerned about the breadth of the review and, you know, whether it's TikTok or not, the breadth of the review, exactly what the criteria are, all that sort of thing. And this is not going to be some snap thing that go, that, that happens. Uh, it's going to be a, uh, a developed process that goes on for some months. Terry, wonderful to get your perspective on it. Just a bit more clarity there from Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy. He's seen a big rally and snap over the last three days. You've seen that, Lisa, the last yes. couple of days? Big pickup. Yeah, how much are people expecting some of the other social media outlets to benefit significantly? Meta also, although there are those job cuts that also help to support some of the gains there. You do wonder what the lobbying is like. I love the idea of, you know, them going down and saying, like, you've got to protect you the security and, and, the, and the mental well-being you know, Facebook, of children. We want to make the world a better place. Exactly, I was just about to Give say. Give us more business. Give our children a greater sense of, you know, being together with their peers and not just, you know, floating above a social mm, media regime more. that tell is isolating them further. You know, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Totally on board with that, Tom. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Coming up next, Alicia I, Levine. I, I, I just totally <laughs> don't get it. How are we going to ban the technology? I mean, I just don't... Well, you ban know. the company, not the tech. I mean, someone else can, can try and do something with the tech, can't they? I mean, they're going to. I don't know. I tried it, you know, We've for an hour. have got reels at and, Instagram. What, have you got you know, shorts at YouTube? Oh, I'm, yeah. on, I'm on yeah. my phone Maybe for an hour. Maybe read a book. Read a book, how original. I'm on a phone. I'm like, really? This is TikTok? Really? You must eat better. Read more. <laughs> what show this is Read turning into? Seriously. Future's unchanged. This is Bloomberg.
credit markets stay healthy, the consumer continues to spend, and wages are continue staying strong. This is not the size of a typical bear market. A 50 basis point hike is actually inflammatory or would raise a lot of concerns among markets. This is really an exercise in central banks and the Fed in particular defending their credibility. Friday's payroll number is really going to be a key print. This week and the next week are going to be important weeks for getting some sense of where is this data, what is the data telling us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television with us. A 2 10 spread, that indicator for equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. John, moments ago, a print of 108. We may get a 109 print on that record curve inversion. Unreal crazy. Pick your word for it. You're two years doing the heavy lifting. You're two year up another three <laughs> basis points, 5.04%. For many, it wasn't just the chairman Powell opened the door to 50. He lowered the bar for 50. That's what City's Andrew Hollenhorst is writing this morning. Others saying the same thing. What do we need on Friday to get 50 basis points? Deutsche Bank says 300k <clears> on payroll, 0.4% core CPI next week. They think this market's going to go with 50. Let's go to the historical perspective, Jess. He is a friend. That's beautiful. Yeah, I know. What's He's the next been line? a good friend of Great. mine. But lately, something's changed. Jesse's girl, 1981. We're back to Volcker. But I'm going to say this <laughs> is not... I didn't even not, recognize it. <laughs> uh, this is not an analog to Paul Volcker. I really take issue and with that. let's be clear. They don't think we're going back to Volcker. They think yeah. we've got Burns. I mean, to say that this is Volcker I would agree. be giving well him said. some credit. Well said. This is about a flip-flop, and that's the problem. <clears throat> Step down to 25, risk reintroducing 50. A month later, one month's data, yes. and all of a sudden backing away and, and reintroducing 50. I actually went back once, not recently, but a couple of years ago, and looked at the actual Arthur Burns shifts, and that's what Greenspan saw. Greenspan invented, measured, 25, 25, 25, and now we risk what John says, Lisa, which is a little bit of uncertainty. If he doesn't go 50, though... Then what, right? I mean, this is the issue. You've got Andrew Hollenhorst over at Citigroup. John was what mentioning him. He now expects a 50 basis point rate hike at the March 22nd meeting because of what they uh, said and what we heard yesterday. He also sees a terminal rate of up to 575, up from a previous uh, expectation of 550. On one level, this is deliberate, right? Right. But then what happens if the Fed doesn't deliver that? Have they already flipped and flopped in the eyes of a market that has taken their guidance from the right. rhetoric that we've heard? Report on what you saw in the IG in a high-yield market given yesterday's festivities. The same thing that we saw in equity markets. Really sanguine look at what potentially why, John, could happen. Why, John, why, why, why did that happen? I, I no still idea. don't have an It's answer. been a story of the year so far. <clears throat> why is tech leading? Right. Yeah, today, why did the Nasdaq rip? We've had a 100 basis point move at the front end of the curve in a single month. Right. You'd think stocks should Ow. be cratering. You'd think that would hurt. Oh, two minutes. I just got elbowed by Alicia Levine. She wants to get in on the conversation. Let's do the data check uh, right now. John, I got to look at 108 basis points on the vanilla spread. We, we, we're we supposed to be there eight months from now. I'm just going through that note that City just dropped after Lisa pointed it out. 255 is what they're looking for on payrolls. 0.5 month on month core CPI next week. They think that's enough to get it done. My question will be on Friday, we'll all be asking this. If we have something like 180, 200, you know, what does it mean? Because we then go into the quiet period. This is the problem when you open the door to 50 again. It's not just the size of a single hike, it's the communication. Once you downshift and you reintroduce another bigger hike, it's like, okay, you're going to go 50 on what and then what? Then what? What do you do after that and yeah. after that? Yeah, What's the glide path look like? I guess that here's my issue is if you want to get to 575, why not just raise to 575 and hold it there? Like, what is the point of going slow? I mean, this raises another issue. Well, that's it's what like, Bullard said, and right. Alarian's alluded to that. Right. So at a certain point, if they just say, OK, we're right. going to raise it to this, we're going to hold it, we're going to oh. see what happens. Why are you crying, Tom? John, I'm not crying. I got elbowed by Alicia here. I don't, is there Alicia any blood? In. Can you She's see any blood? Bring She's been very patient. She's been very patient. Alicia Levine with us right now, BNY Mellon. She's over there. It's like the, the Bramo cam was on her while you were talking. And she wants to jump in, jump in, Good. respond to what we were talking about. This hurt. Look, I, I think I think what Powell did yesterday was the right thing to do. The data has has been hot and if he didn't put 50 on the table it then threatens a further loosening of financial conditions which will unanchor inflation expectations so he had to put it on the table i actually think it was the right thing to do but now the problem is he's locked in because if they don't go 50 Right. It's, it's been a series of locking in. The Fed talks too much. I have thought that throughout this whole cycle. There's too much talking, too much talk of disinflation eight weeks ago, 13 times. But in the end, by putting 50 on the table in the near term, they're almost forced to go through it. I think a 200 number on Friday would do it. I want to pick up on Lisa's theme. 
of this morning so far. If 200K gets it done, it's a pretty low bar. Why are stocks so resilient? That is confounding and the question of the year. And to your point, why was NASDAQ leading yesterday? So let's just point out that even after the price action yesterday, <clears throat> stocks were where they were on Thursday. And the disconnect between the bond volatility and what's happening in the stock market is ever widening this year, in year to date in 2023. The market has been remarkably resilient, as have credit spreads, as you've just talked about, which is what's holding up the market here. So I think what the market is seeing is that ultimately that 10 years having a hard time over 4 percent and ultimately the, the 10 years going to move lower because a slowdown will be coming. The Fed's going to wind up pushing us into recession. So I get a lot of hate mail about being too gloomy and people who think that I always am glass half empty and just, you know, I should go have a little bit more fun. And so some people will say that, you know, if you take a look at been what's through. been going on, <laughs> trying and, let's try to look at the bright side. Maybe stocks and credit <clears throat> spreads are seeing a picture that, you know, the rate volatility isn't. Maybe there is this resilience. Maybe that strength is, you know, going to carry through even if rates do go up to 6%. Do you buy that? So I, I do buy the thought that the economy appears to be less sensitive to rate hikes than originally thought. I mean, we are now at 450, 475 in 12 months, wither the crisis, wither the great knock-on effects. It's, we're nowhere, okay? And I think that surprised a lot of us who've seen other rate cycles here. So that has to do with the fact that most of mortgages are fixed rate at 3%. People are making the spread on a 5% six-month treasury, right? So they're actually making money on this trade. But even if the economy is less resilient, the Fed will probably have to go higher and will eventually work. It's just going to take longer. The data and the real economy continues to be fairly strong. You're seeing weakening in certain parts of the economy, such as housing. Clearly, commercial real estate is at risk. That's flashing a warning sign here. But that's really the beginning of it. It just hasn't happened yet. As long as labor is strong and as long as workers are getting wage increases, which they are, you can keep this going further. So what do you do with the idea of a 6% Fed funds rate? What do you do with a 50 basis point rate hike on March 22nd? How does that change what you buy? So it's a really interesting thing. So far, cyclicals this year have, have worked, as have growth, right? And I think that begins to change a little bit. You have to think of this as if the Fed has to go to 6% or even higher, it's not our base case, but you have to start opening your mind to the fact that it could happen, then you, you start having to see a recession by the end of the year or even into 2024. The confounding part of this year is that the recession hasn't happened yet. And it's very hard to predict with the strength we see in other sectors, such as the service sector, which continues to hold up the economy. But you have to expect it within, let's say, the next 12 months. And with that, you do start asking the question, will cyclicals continue mm -hmm. to outperform? And, and, that's, and that's really where you have to go with this. Well, because the defensive mm -hmm. stocks have been terrible this year, right? Healthcare has been tough. Staples have been tough. Utilities mm -hmm. have been tough. And the cyclicals have ripped. So the question is, what happens if the recession really starts to be priced in? I'm not going to mince. On International Women's Day, there are many women that have provided leadership, and you have with bulletproof mathematics and education. I mean, your your path here was painful in terms of, like, lean over the desk. Right now, we are at a moment where we've got massive first and second derivative moves, and it comes down to Nassim Taleb's math. The gravity's back. And as Taleb says, you got to have skin in the game, which means all the shadows are out there, all the worries are out there. And you study it on a tail with a Poisson distribution. We're not going to go into the math this morning. You but are. are we, no, I'm not. I'm not going to go into the math this morning. But are we there now where we've got legitimate tail risk of, as Elarian would say, the unknown unknowns out there? Yes, we do. We've always thought that simply because we don't think you get out of a rate cycle that quickly. I think what's unspoken in this conversation today is the debt ceiling. That could change what the Fed does rather remarkably and rather quickly as well. And the fact that the U.S. hasn't had a recession in the third year of a presidential term because it's an election cycle coming up. What happens to the pressure on Powell if we actually get that recession by the end of the year? Can he finish the job? Yep. I don't think Powell's burns yet.
The question is, will he be Burns in the future? I think for now, Powell's sticking to the Volcker playbook, and I think he's doing a pretty good job at it. The question is, if we get that recession, if your unemployment rate goes to 3.8 percent from here, which doesn't feel like a lot, you'll be getting he'll be getting pressure from the right and the left. You're just much more diplomatic than I am, Alicia. You're going to stick with us, Alicia Levine there, VMY Mellon. To Alicia's point, this tension's happening in the semi-annual testimony with unemployment at 3.4 percent. To Alicia's point, what happens, Tom, yeah. when it starts climbing? And they're still pushing yeah, because and inflation's and, and, still above and, target. And I'd overlay on that this continuing belief that we're working with, as Alicia says, the uh, the uh, Volcker playbook. It's not an analog. This is not analog back to 80s. It's original. Right now, Powell's in between a rock and a hard place. I think what we just heard about the idea of an election cycle is going to be very interesting. Do we start to see if there's a little bit more weakness? All of a sudden, pause. All of a sudden, I don't know. Like, all I of a sudden, complete. I guarantee one you thing. Know. Senator Warren's going to find some company and find some company pretty quickly. Alicia, you're going to stay with us if that's OK, because we've got an ADP report coming out in about four minutes' time. And a lot of people sit around the table on Wall Street and say, the ADP report doesn't matter, and then it comes out and people trade on it. <laughs> every time. Um, every this single is time. True. This so, is true. So Mike McKee's going to break that data point down for you. Alicia's going to respond to it in about 20 minutes' time. We'll also catch up with the brilliant Diane Swong, the chief economist at KPMG. Looking forward to that conversation. If you are just waking up, lucky you, this is what your market looks like. Equity futures look like this on the S&P. I mean, I'm jealous. I'm not having a dig. I'm just jealous. I, I would love to be just waking up. Can't sleep in these days, Bramo. You've got the same thing. Can't <laughs> get course. past like six. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you wake up every day at four, know, like, what do you Saturday think? mornings are like 6.05. Maybe if we have, you know, better food to eat and Anyway, I promise you some price action. Futures up by about a tenth of 1%. Yield on a two-year, 5.03%. On a 10-year, 3.95. The spread between the two, negative 108 basis points. Unbelievable. Deepest yield curve inversion going back to the early 1980s. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Bond traders have boosted bets that the Federal Reserve will speed up the pace of interest rate increases. That's after Fed Chair Jerome Powell testified before a Senate committee. Powell told lawmakers he's ready for faster monetary tightening if economic data justifies it. Interest rate swaps indicate traders see a half point hike is more likely this month. President Biden's new spending plan will include what officials call one of the nation's biggest peacetime defense budgets ever. The total will exceed $835 billion. It includes big increases for weapons buying and research and development. In the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, riot police used tear gas and water cannons to disperse protesters unhappy over a so-called foreign agents bill. The measure would curb the influence of groups that rely on funding from the U.S. and Europe. The critics fear Georgia is sliding away from the EU and NATO and is increasingly pro-Russian. U.S. safety regulators have opened an investigation into Tesla's Model Y SUV. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration received two complaints that the vehicle's steering wheel can come off while you're driving it. And the probe covers about 120,000 Model Ys that were built for the 2023 model year. And the German sports shoemaker Adidas has slapped its dividend and shaken up management. New CEO Bjorn Golden is personally replacing the head of global brands. Now, meanwhile, Golden is floating the idea of selling the $1.3 billion of Yeezy gear and donating the profit to charity. Adidas halted sales after cutting ties with the rapper known as Ye. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We don't care about the ADP report. No. Nope. And then we trade on it. Mike McKee <laughs> has that ADP report right now. Morning, Mike. John, uh, it is a 242,000 number for the month of February that ADP finds in terms of its changes uh, to the U.S. payrolls. Uh, that is up from 106,000, which was their initial report for the month of January. 200,000 was the forecast, so this comes in better. It looks like at this point uh, most of the jobs created were in medium and large establishments, which is kind of interesting because it's been the bars and restaurants 
restaurants who've been looking for people, but according to ADP, small establishments lost 61,000 jobs. Also losing jobs, construction. That's something people have been waiting for as the housing market slows down. 16,000 jobs lost, but a lot of that made up for it in manufacturing where 43,000 jobs were added, 83,000 in leisure and hospitality. Not sure how that works with the 61,000 lost in that area. ADP also puts down, uh, out a pay growth index these days, and according to uh, them, pay growth for people who stayed in their jobs was 7.2%, which is the slowest pace of gain in 12 months. For job changers, it fell to 14.3 from 14.9. Now, I did some calculations this morning. Since ADP came up with their new numbers, their new system, uh, they have been off by an average of 132,000 a month compared with the non-farm payrolls number from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So make of all this what you will. Mike, stick with me. Very briefly, just moments ago, the two-year, 10-year spread <clears throat> dropped below 110 basis points. Just haven't seen these numbers since the early 1980s. We had some more weight to the front end of the curve. So your two years now higher by four or five basis points. The two year yield 5.05%. And what are you seeing on a 10 year? Two year yield higher, 10 year yield lower by a single basis point. 395. We'll pick up on that story in just a moment. Equity futures in the face of all of this, pretty resilient. Only down a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. So you've got an upside surprise, 242,000 against the previous month, the revised figure of 119. Now, Mike McKee, people will look at this number and say, OK, like we do every single month, what does it mean for me on Friday going into payrolls? And how close was last month's ADP print to what we got from the overall official NFP a couple of days later? <laughs> well, it didn't make ADP look very good last month because they forecast 106,000 jobs created and we got 517,000 from the government numbers. Now, ADP's revised theirs all the way up to 119,000. So there's uh, still about 300,000 disparity between the two. So I don't think you can draw many conclusions from this report about what we're going to see on Friday. A lot of statistical noise in the January numbers. Jay Powell talked about that yesterday. We had weather, we had uh, seasonal adjustments, and we had uh, population adjustments. So it's kind of hard to get a read on what we might get on Friday mm -hmm. as well. But it is uh, that is a number that is going to move the markets much more than ADP. Michael, how will you study the revisions that we see in non-farm payrolls? Well, it's, it's going to be a matter of comparison now. We got the revisions to January, so we have to look at February. Uh, it's very hard every year to compare January to December because of the changes that they make. Uh, but now we can compare February to January, and we know that uh, the weather wasn't quite as bad in February in most places as it was in uh, December. Um, January was uh, warmer. So uh, we'll look at all those factors and try to figure out whether it had a significant impact or not. But it's going to be the headline number uh, that is going to make a big difference. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. As always, Mike McKee there breaking down that headline number for you on ADP, 242,000. Equity's a little bit softer off the back of this, Tom, down a tenth of 1%. Yeah. Yields a bit higher at the front end. As I mentioned, the two-year versus 10-year, that spread dropped below 110 briefly negative 109 basis points tom is where we are right now and, and, you know, we've got to get to alicia john but i just don't know how you can model in quiescence here when you look at what happened in france spain germany and the rest there seems to be a persistent trend here it's on to payrolls on friday but ultimately yeah. just slowly pricing it in just a little bit more a 50 Stunning. basis point move later this month and, and just as an aside here argentinian pesos through 200 which is a huge benchmark of the fragility of that nation 200 pesos per dollar with the world of Damien Sassar. We'll get to that in another uh, moment. Alicia Levine continues with, with us right now. Explain as an equity person how I can avoid going to 4.97% cash. Wow. <laughs> so we have, we have signaled to our clients this year very explicitly that we're in a regime change for equities here, that what worked in the last 15 years post-global financial crisis of zero rates and high multiples is just not the playbook for this year. And that means to go a little bit lower down the cap scale. It means not to go back to 2019. What we saw in January was, oh, well, if last year was 1974, then this year is 2019. Just grab the same old stocks, 
if, and they've sold off 50, 70 percent and buy them and they'll rally. We think that's actually a mistake for what the world we're in, which is structurally higher inflation with a structurally tighter labor, for, labor, labor force and higher rates. That's where you have to be. So you have to be in sectors that do well with higher rates and some inflation in the system. So a lot of longer term investors will come on the show and say they don't trade around these data points. They certainly don't trade on ADP. They don't trade on the payrolls report. They collect the data and they, may, they adjust their view over time. Is this time different? Do you find yourself trading or making views more dramatically on some of these data points? So we take big long term views. We look out 12 to 18 months. We don't trade and we don't advise our clients to trade because trading tends to be the way you kill your equity performance and in other asset classes for that matter. So we take a long view and the long view here is higher inflation structurally, higher rates structurally, maybe R squared higher, which means you're just going to wind up with the Fed funds rate, ultimately, when inflation's over, over 3%. If we're not going back to that 1% to 2% world. That's a very different world for investing, and that's what we've advised going forward. You can't trade around this. It's too volatile. How do you know when equity markets, when risk assets, have woken up to the reality that you're just portrayed? So. The, the issue is what's rallying and, so, and what's working. Right now, what's, what's working is the playbook from the post-global financial crisis of near zero rates. In all of our analysis, that is not the world we're in. Could we get to a place where there's a deep recession and the Fed cuts? Of course we can. But once inflation's in the system, it's very hard to get rid of it. And we just think you're in that world where the cyclicals will work, the materials, the industrials will work, a little bit lower on the market cap, a little more value-oriented stocks, this will work. I don't like using value because right now there are plenty of tech stocks which are value stocks. So I don't like using that because it tends to mean sectors, but just companies that can earn, that have some dividends and that increasing their cash flow, that's what we're looking for. You can't trade around that. It has to be GARPY, growth at a reasonable price. Alicia, I'm just sitting here thinking about what's the kind of data point we need on Friday to cause the most amount of pain. Is it a massive miss and a big revision to the previous month? Where would that leave us? Is there enough data in the totality of the data over the last month or so to take that revision and put it to one side and say, well, things are still heading in this direction? Or do we just flip all over again? So it's a very interesting question because I think it, the, the answer to that is that a miss on the number, you know, in the 50 to 100 range, because the market's all in on higher rates for longer. I mean, wherever the market is, is all in, the pain is on the other side here. And so you've now have positioning that reflects that. So it's been a weird market. Every four weeks we're ping ponging, yep. which is why we take a long term view, because you can't really trade around it. We, we've we've thought really since last summer, higher for longer. The Fed will hike and hold. Don't look for the pivot. We knew the pivot was wrong. We knew it was wrong months ago. But Powell, Powell didn't know. Powell. <laughs> <laughs> you could have told him, Alicia. Well, you know, maybe he wants to be well, liked. But, maybe. But, but, it's maybe. True. but, but the, the point <laughs> being, we invest with that view. You cannot trade around the data points. Too difficult. Alicia Levine, fantastic, as always, of BMY Mellon. Payrolls coming up on Friday. So much of this could change with payrolls on Friday, and then it's on to CPI next week, Lisa, on the 14th. You asked a great question. What's going to inflict maximal yeah, pain? That no. Because that happens all the time, and that seems to be the data that we get again and again. It's like, you thought this? Ha <laughs> ha. Yep. Can I just say, it's International Women's Day, so we try and make the effort to celebrate world-class women on Wall Street. But this lineup in the nine o'clock would be a world class lineup any day of the week. Victoria Fernandez across Mark, Oksana Aronoff for JP Morgan, and Bridgewater's Karen Carniel Tambor. Look out for that in the nine o'clock hour, counting down to the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance, Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell preparing to get the markets open in the next hour on Bloomberg at television. An historic moment, the yield inversion, a negative 110 basis points right now on the 210 spread. Equities churning as we can. And Lisa, we barely talked about it quickly here. Dollar stronger today. Dollar stronger across everything. If you look at the dollar index, it's actually the strongest going back to late right. November, which raises a question. Again, where are the pain trades and how much are they going to get unwound to this flip flop?
happy world of record this, record that, and then ending right. up at the same place. The pain is we've got a wonderful half hour. We're going to get through this quickly. Michael McKee on trade and then an important chart. Michael, what do you have on trade? Well, the trade balance for January comes in at negative $68.3 billion. That's up from the prior month's 67.4. It's a little lower than the anticipated number, according to the Bloomberg survey. Uh, trade, of course, a little bit less important than it has been in <coughs> right. uh, the overall market thinking these days, but it does suggest uh, <laughs> perhaps a little bit uh, lower GDP uh, profile. And this historic moment, it's always Michael McKee who delivers clarity, and he does now with a chart. Folks, for you on radio, this is the 210 spread, the difference between the two-year and the 10-year. I call it the vanilla spread. And what McKee has done is establish the timeline of events before this collapse to ever greater uh, inversion. And it can be, you know, as simple as uh, what we saw with payrolls, what we saw with retail sales, bringing it all the way out to Mester Bullard. When did it break, Mike? When did we really break into further inversion? Uh, yesterday? <laughs> Actually, we broke into further inversion on about the 2nd of uh, March. But the numbers that uh, came in earlier, uh, when you look at uh, what happened after payrolls, after CPI, after uh, the uh, retail sales numbers. And then, of course, we had uh, Mester and Bullard coming out saying they could have done 50 at the last meeting. The market traded sideways to up in terms of the yield curve. It didn't go down at all. And the only time it started going down again is we got the PCE numbers, and then we had this big drop yesterday when Jay Powell came out and said, hey, I looked at that chart, and I see all these numbers are getting uh, – we're hot in January, so if, if they stay that way, we're going to have to move. I just want to know – where were you? Where where were the markets? Where was this yield curve when all this negative information was coming in that would have told you that the Fed might take that position? It's a good question, and perhaps it's because Jay Powell did seem to embrace the disinflation narrative until he came out yesterday and talked about the revisions to the data, the backward-looking revisions that made it look like they weren't even making as much progress as they had initially thought. How significant have the revisions been to really reshape the narrative at the beginning of the year? Well, they do reshape the narrative because we did see uh, revisions that uh, took away a lot of maybe half or so of the <clears throat> progress that the Fed thought they'd made. But those revisions were revealed on the dates that these other indicators came out. So if you were doing your work on uh, where you think the Fed might be, uh, you probably would have moved at that time. The Fed was looking at, uh, on February 1st, I think, at uh, numbers that had not changed. And so we're doing a little bit of uh, risk management in going to 25, yeah. because at that point, the data were telling them they might be getting close to uh, really restrictive, and they didn't want to go too far. Now, the data tell them to do something different. Michael McKee, moving forward to Jolt Survey. We'll see that here at 10 o'clock. Michael McKee, thank you uh, so much. You should point out that, well, on International Women's Day, you can be a reporter who says, well, I got a fancy degree from Chicago, but I know nothing about bonds. And through sheer inspiration and perspiration, you learn about bonds. What was it like, Lisa Abramowitz, your first day in the bond world? <laughs> Well, it was in 2007 in August when the commercial paper market was freezing so up. So it's definitely uh, a moment of, uh, of, of real tension yeah. and drama that people don't associate with bonds. Did you just pile up 15 books around you and just read Fabozzi cover to cover and the rest of it? No, I called traders and a number of them cursed and hung up because that was the moment they that we were in, that. in terms of the, the <clears throat> tense feeling. And yeah. I do wonder, yeah. we saw the lack of drama for a decade or more, almost two decades. Yeah. And here we are, and the drama it's is It's getting back. very 070. Someone that knows that is Diane Swank. She's chief economist at KPMG. And Diane, I'm just thrilled that you are here today. And I place you in a group with Abby Joseph Cohen of Goldman Sachs, now at Columbia University. And, of course, the wonderful Sally Krawchuk as well, who changed securities research at Sanford Bernstein years ago. And then there was Swank in 1985. I think she was out of junior high school at the time. And she was in Chicago <laughs> landing a job at First Chicago uh, Corporation. What was it like the first day on the job, uh, Diane? I mean, out of Michigan, it, it, was, it was unique at the time, right? Uh, it was unique, and to be honest with you, then I went on to University of Chicago as well. But um, 
You know, I rode up the escalator, and I often describe the person I was mentoring uh, in the 80s, and that person was me, and I looked like a man in some ways with my short cropped hair, my male-dominated kind of women's suit, and I even had wingtip pumps, which um, <laughs> says a lot, although I refused to wear those. I had bow tie, and I took it off. I just couldn't take it anymore, and I put it around my waist, um, which is kind of me as well. But, you know, until I got to step into, for me, my femininity, my career didn't take off, and luckily that occurred very shortly thereafter, and I had a terrific mentor. You always need someone that is a terrific mentor, and he once said to me, um, it's right. not that I'm altruistic, Diane. You make me look good. What do we need to do forward on International Women's Day? I mean, there's all sorts of cohorts here and debates and that. Ms. Swank, you've lived it. What do we need to do forward to get more women into economics, finance, and investment? Well, it's really kind of a sad commentary, particularly in economics on the academic side. And, you know, the bottom line is that we need to all be able to step into our truth and who we are. And that is not allowed in a lot of these fields. And that's something that I have a really hard time struggling with because it took me a long time to do that. I had to work through two maternity leaves. My son almost died. I was on TV four weeks after I delivered my daughter. I don't wish that for anyone. Yeah. And the bottom line is we have to acknowledge the biology, and the biology is that women are delivering babies, and you know, same-sex yeah. couples are able to have children. We have to support paternity leave, and that is really important. We just don't do it. The fact that our female participation rate yeah. and our male participation rate among 25 to 54-year-olds a group I no longer belong to, is the lowest in the G20, which is really the G19, because we don't include Russia anymore. That is really despicable. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our neighbors to the north, Canada, has a 12% higher participation rate among prime-age women than we do in the United States. So yeah. it's here with some, you know, I have a sadness to this day in the fact that I wasn't able to do more and I still got a lot of work to do for everyone behind me. Lisa, why don't you pick it up here? I mean, there's some themes there that are really, really trenchant and how alone America is in this debate. Well, I want to go to what you managed to accomplish in that time, Diane, which is an incredible <clears throat> reputation and prowess within the economics field at a moment that is highly tenuous. We're trying to put together a lot of real uncertainty into some sort of forecast. What did you make of what Jerome Powell said yesterday on Capitol Hill? Well, you know, I thought he finally stepped into where we knew the Fed was and the fact that all the headlines actually reported the same Chairman Jay Powell is really important, and that is they are data dependent. The data and the narrative has shifted, and that does put a half percent on the table. Now, could it change? There's two more key data points coming out before they meet on March 21st, but I think it's important that he laid out just how data dependent they are and the willingness to pivot. You got another Powell pivot, and that is that we could get a half percent at this next meeting and that rates are going higher faster. I think that's very important information to have. It's one that we've been arguing. And yes, the data has been out there officially since the Valentine's Day massacre of that inflation number we came out, but the revisions to that were out prior to that the Friday before it. And we were looking at it going, oh my gosh. This has changed the entire narrative. Well, is the data that we've gotten since then, and I think about the ADP data that a lot of people are dismissive of, has it confirmed that strength? Or is there any sign that perhaps we're going to see some sort of downward revision or some sort of downside surprise in labor market that has surprised for almost a year straight to the upside? We certainly could see some cooling, and I think we are seeing some cooling, and I think the ADP data is now the way that they've redone it, and I give a lot of credit to Neela Richardson over at ADP for not making it a forecast of the official payrolls data. It is its own data set, but it still shows that there's a lot of strength in wage gains there. That's terrific for wage earners, but to the extent that we're seeing continued upward pressure on inflation tied to demand, which is tied to the way 
wages people earn, that is a concern for the Fed. And I think that data, I mean, we know the month of January, part of the reason ADP's report was so weak was because <coughs> it is more sensitive to the floods we saw in California. So people who didn't mm. work the whole week didn't show up as much on payrolls in that week that was a survey week. It was not the same for the national data. If they got paid even a dime that week, they showed up on national payrolls. Mm. So I do think we'll see some downside surprises as well as we come off this, you know, unseasonably hot uh, January in many ways. But the bottom line is you need the threshold to get us to the Fed feeling like it's actually got inflation under control and that right. inflation will not become a more entrenched inflation is very, very high. That means their threshold to slow down rate hikes is high right now. Diane Swank, thank you for joining us today, of course, with Kate. I will say, I want to just note also that uh, stocks have turned around. They are now positive again, which, I mean, look, I wasn't going to go there. You can, in this market, can yeah. you say so? I think that that's interesting because the yes. lack of any kind of conclusive move after what we heard from Jay Powell yesterday, after data that kind of confirms that narrative if you want to have some more data to confirm your narrative, to me, it's just amazing the resilience and it continues. And the NASDAQ. Yeah, we're going to go to break, and and uh, when we come back, will it be red right on the screen? I, do, I mean, the, the way yeah, we're but... moving this morning, who knows? What you need to know on this historic day is we did print negative 110 basis points of curve inversion back to 1981. A reason to stay with us through the morning. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo in less than five weeks federal reserve chair jerome powell has changed his tune on february 1st powell said the disinflationary process had begun but on tuesday he told the senate committee the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than anticipated now, powell says he's ready for a faster monetary tightening if economic data justifies it in the UK, Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt may give companies extra tax relief on investment spending. Hunt's looking for measures to boost economic growth in his spring budget. He's under pressure to act because Britain's flagship corporate tax break expires on April 1st. The White House has endorsed a bill in Congress that could give the president authority to ban or force a sale of TikTok. Now that could break a deadlock over how to address privacy concerns around the popular Chinese-owned app. The bill doesn't mention TikTok, but the video sharing app is a clear target. It has about 100 million users in the U.S. Mortgage rates in the U.S. have now risen for four weeks straight to the highest level since mid-November. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, the contract rate for a 30-year mortgage rose eight basis points to just below 6.8 percent. Now, at the same time, the group's index of mortgage applications increased. And the most popular place for the super rich to own a home is New York. That's according to a new report by data firm Altrada. Now, the report looks at those with a net worth of over $30 million. London finished second in the survey, followed by Hong Kong and Los Angeles. The U.S. took 14 of the 20 places on that list. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. has slowed down considerably. Credit markets stay healthy. The consumer continues to spend and, and wages are continuing staying strong. This is not the size of a typical bear market. At the same time, we're not expecting this massive bull rally either because we don't quite see the catalyst there. We do think the equities can drop lower, but for us, it would take a lot to see those October lows again. Anaheim pushing against the caution out there. Actually, at least am I right on this? I thought that Ms. Han was quite optimistic yesterday. I thought there was a framework there of own equities. And basically this idea yeah. that perhaps we're not in this bear market <clears throat> that everyone's saying that we're in in the bear market rally, she rejects the premise. I'm not going to give my opinion or your, your opinion, but boy, it is tumultuous here. Thank you for being with us today towards an hour and 10 minutes. And, you know, usually I'm going to say that the day after, whether it's Senate day after or House day after, as is 
today, House Financial Committee, uh, with Mr. McHenry of North Carolina. It's a yawner. Uh, maybe it's not today. What is the question <clears throat> that you wish the Congress members would ask Jay Powell that was not answered yesterday? I, I, what I always want to know is, because of the historic idiot lack of dissent within the Fed, is what is the makeup he sees as they go to the March 22nd meeting, and what will the debate be over where we are right now? I don't think we know what that debate is. I want someone to ask, what's the liability of not having a consistent message? What's the liability of possibly increasing rate hikes and then decreasing yeah. them and not yeah. having some sort of reliability in the market? Maybe yeah. it's okay. Maybe they'll say, you know what, this no, is just the nature no, of data dependency. No, I don't think they will. No, the, the unanchored is a the theme. They want to they avoid unanchored, and some of our guests, uh, including in the last hour, Alicia Levine uh, alluding to the 2% is over. We'll have to see. Someone studying that. Let's rip up the script here with Seema Shah, Chief Global Strategist, Principal Global Investors. Seema, to that point, are you working within your beautiful holistic view? Are you working that it is a central bank set of central banks, I should say, that aren't going to get back to what there was? They're not going to get back to sub 2%. 2%, 2.x%, if there's a new level we have to get used to? So, Heidi, I think that what we're going to see is you're going to see them reach 2% temporarily, even potentially go below 2%, especially if you start to think about hard landings. But if that is to be sustained, you have a very, very different dynamic. So actually, we think that if you're looking at over the next decade or so, we're going to see a world which is very different for the last 10 years, new regime. I know a lot of guests have been talking about this already today. Uh, this is a world where you don't have inflation of just below 2%, but it's not very, very high, but certainly no longer below 2% like we've become accustomed to. Seema, with the turmoil of the last 24 hours, I'm looking now at 109 basis points on the 210 spread. Translate that for our audience that are not spread sophisticates. What's it mean for nominal rates forward? So look, the key takeaway from this is that the yield curve doesn't necessarily tell you what's going to happen. But it is telling us that investors think that in 10 years' time, or if we're thinking out over the longer term, yields need to be lower, that the Fed is going to have to cut rates in response to something. So the point here is that 100 basis points has only been seen a couple of times through history. When has it been seen? It's seen in 1929, before the Great Depression, in 1973, before another terrible time for financial markets, and then again, just before we saw Volcker come in and really take control of the inflation situation. So history is not on our side here. It's telling us but although economic indicators look fairly strong today, there is pain probably coming ahead. So this is a bit of a hate, head fake market rally today. Um, investors really need to get prepared. Well, what is fair value then? How do you understand what investors have started to price in the reality that you predict to be the case? So I, I don't think investors have fully priced it in. You know, what we've seen over the last 10 years is, is investors getting very accustomed to low volatility and higher returns. And there is a necessary shift in mind that needs to take place um, in order to prepare your portfolios, you know, prepare your, prepare your clients. This isn't going to be a world where you're going to have very, very high returns and low volatility anymore. And in fact, you need to be thinking a little bit more about diversification, thinking more about fixed income quality and, of course, increasing your exposure to alternatives, which could give you that additional pickup that we have been unlikely to see um, in the absence of them. How much have you increased the weighting of fixed income in your portfolios? So we have increased our, our weighting uh, about four or five months ago, really moving into the higher quality segments. So this is on the short end for treasuries, uh, increasing to investment grade and securitized debt. We have maintained an underweight to high yield. You know, you, you look at high yield spreads today, they have performed very well this year. But the only times that they've been tighter than they are today is really when the Fed has been dovish or you have an expansionary economy. <clears throat> Two factors that we're not expecting to see going forward. So this is probably as best it's going to get for some segments of the credit market. So it's really important that investors, yes, increase your exposure to fixed income because of diversification benefits, but make sure that you are focused on that oh. high-quality segment of the market. Okay, that's too complicated for me, Seema. Help me out here. Do we flip 60-40 on its head, or it's 40 equity and 60 bonds? So I don't think it's, it's necessarily flipping it quite like that, but I also wouldn't say 60-40 is, is the way forward. We're thinking that, look, you have to have a, a fairly significant portion focused on equities going forward over the long term. Again, same thing for fixed income, but now you need to start introducing the alternative element into your bucket if you want to have any hope 
of gaining any kind of reasonable return going forward. So it is rethinking the past, isn't it? but we do believe in the diversification benefits of bonds still, despite the, the terrible um, performance of them last year. <clears throat> Seema, in the turmoil here, I, I need a guide. And you know, I'd make a joke about it, Seema, and say I need a guide for the next 78 minutes. But I just need a guide to get to Monday, okay? We've got to get out in front of key U.S. data as well. What do you do if you're scared stiff to get to Monday? Because I understand the, the fear of getting to Monday. You know, we've just heard from a Fed that has said that everything, they are as data dependent as the market is, uh, which means that the non-farm payrolls number on Friday is of the utmost importance. Even if we get through to Monday, we're still going to think about Tuesday with the CPI number. Uh, I don't think we've ever been in this situation before. I think it's very, very uncertain. It's not helpful for investors. It's certainly not helpful to the public. Uh, I actually believe that there's a bit too much transparency from the Fed and taking a step back from their side, giving us a bit of a slightly longer term view. And certainly as an investor from our side, <clears throat> that really that importance of focusing on the longer term rather than the kind of the week by week dynamics, because they are very very confusing right now. And Seema, Alicia Levine agrees with you and says, they're just talking too much. Just stop at this point. It's too much transparency. I am curious about all of the narratives that are getting turned on their heads this year. And I'm thinking about the go long Europe idea that we saw really perpetuated throughout January and even some of last month. Does that change as the Fed potentially becomes much more hawkish than people had expected? I think you could see a little bit of the drowning out um, effect coming through for Europe. But there is a slightly different narrative for Europe, which is I think is going to carry it further, which is that whereas the US, we think, is really heading for a recession, Europe does feel like the recession is behind them. Their economic weakness is in their past. And from here on, we're not expecting a very, very strong recovery, but it is a fairly solid recovery, which they are then helped along by China's reopening. Um, some fundamental improvements focus on ESG, which I think is going to be a really important focus for investors, of course, going forward. And they're miles ahead there. So I think the, the European story is stronger than you, what you see for the U.S. But if I'm going to rank global uh, regions, I'm going to put emerging markets in China above Europe, uh, simply because they have um, a very, very different economic re regime going on there compared to what you're seeing for developed markets. Seema, thank you so much. Just a terrific brief this morning amid this terminal. Seema Shah uh, with us this morning from uh, the principal uh, group 108 basis points on the two cent spread. Key item here, as Lisa mentions, green on the, the screen. Let's move back 90 minutes ago, Lisa, where we talked about, I believe it was Alicia Levine, I may stand corrected on that, maybe it was Kelsey Barrow, where we talked about bond issuance. So you got a company and they got talcum powder, they got band aids, they got baby oil. We well, know what that company is in America immediately. It's Johnson & Johnson. I hate the name, Kenview, K-E-N-V-U-E. You think, you think a McKinsey consultant came up with that? <laughs> well, hold on a second. I'm going to name it. So <clears throat> they have a debt offering that they're selling right now. They're selling dollar bonds, and they're selling them in eight parts, including a 40-year security. Yeah. And there are two ways to think about this. One is, well, you know, you might as well fund the spinoff and do this now. The second way is... If you want to get in, get in now, because you could potentially even Kelsey go higher. Barrow That's what Kelsey believe, was saying. Yeah. And that, to me, is really <clears throat> interesting, especially with a 40-year piece. What are these companies hedging against yeah. with selling and locking and borrowing costs now? And, and Johnson & Johnson, I mean, just, well, they're 8.1% debt. I mean, at least they're not embarrassing. Let's look at another upstart company that has trouble generating cash. Apple Computer, <laughs> debt weight, 5.1%. That breaks every single comment I've ever seen in any fixed income textbook. Let's see when Verizon sells because they are good at timing the market. That's uh, Apple and Verizon are some oh, of the like ones that, that manage to sell Just debt. Just me, folks, but I can peak. do this. <laughs> and then, you know, usually bond prices go down. 51% debt out at VZ. 51, bank at 52%. What an historic day this has been. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.